settings and then I'm going to record there. Am I really though? Nope. <laughs> I hit pause and now, okay. <laughs> It's a learning curve. Well, <laughs> it's a it's 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 not so much a curve as like a complete up like roller coaster up and down because some days I got it, and then some days back to square one. Yeah, yes, Listen, I get it. I Just get it. bumbling. Yep, yep. All right, ready? <clears throat> yeah. Here we go. What's up, everybody? Welcome to the first episode of True Crime and Cocktails Famous Fatalities Edition. That's right, it's season two, episode one, or episode 17 for those counting along at home. As always, I am your host, Lauren Ash, and I am joined, as always, by my co hostess with the most S, Christy Oxborough. How are you feeling? I'm great. Uh, uh, mainly because, first of all, season two vibes, I feel I gotta go in, gotta come in hot. Yep. Gotta come in positive. Yeah. Uh, and also because this is the first time I'm seeing you. I know. Since uh I guess episode 16, which we recorded like before Christmas-ish. Yeah, it was before so Christmas. It feels like it's been a year, and yeah, I didn't like the time, but I'm better now. Yeah, I didn't I didn't care for the time apart either. You know, that's the that's the one um, you know, delightful side effect from this whole thing is that now we've become accustomed to a weekly hangout and if we don't yeah. get one. I mean, the other day I texted Christy because because we've been on Christmas break and whatnot and we haven't been actively researching, et cetera. I just sent her a text that was like, I don't like that I'm not hearing from you incessantly. <laughs> Which, <laughs> without context, may look like I'm a very emotionally abusive friend. But with yeah. context, it means just normally we're in constant contact and there had been a real lull, which I didn't care for. Yeah, it just shows you care. I mean, that just shows the victim I am. <laughs> <laughs> that I'm so quick to, in my, uh, what is it? Um, uh, fuck, Blink-182 did a song about it. No, I don't know where gone. you were going. <laughs> this is going great. <laughs> yeah, we're, yeah. We're season two. two is real, really kicked off. Uh, there's a, there's a shit. I, all I can think in my brain is like, I think it's Swedish something. Where like the, the, the kidnapper or kidnappy falls in love with the kidnapper. Oh, Stockholm syndrome. There is Stockholm. I said <laughs> Swedish. Ah. Oh, shit. She's on fire already. Jeez. Well, that leads me into the question I ask every week, which is what you drinking over there? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I maybe got a little heavy handed, which is no surprise by my current state already. Mm. But you may be surprised. I'm doing a scoot. <gasps> I am honored. I can't stop. You the, love the scoot. I love the scoot. The cranberry, mm. just a touch of lime, and that mint. I'm finding, I love it. I'm finding mint is hard to find. Well, you're gonna love this, this. time of year. <laughs> spoken like, well, yeah, this time of year certainly, yeah. but spoken like a true nena, you could grow your own. <laughs> Because I'll tell you this, it grows like wildfire. My background, yeah. my, my backyard is full of it. And I think you could grow it in a pot inside. I love that I'm suggesting that you grow mint in your home to facilitate my cocktail, which I like. I like. I didn't even consider that, but I I am on board. I'm not a plant person. Like, I don't really know what to do with them. Like, I know you're just supposed to kind of like look at them. Yep. And water them and stuff. Yeah. But I'm not even good at that. Like I'm terrible with them. But if it like does something for my cocktails, maybe it's something I need to consider. Listen, I I had a I, full disclosure. I have a a lawn maintenance person or a gardener. Sure. And both come, uh, you know, to tend to my um my gardens hardly but anyway I, I asked him if he would put in a small vegetable garden which he did which was successful for me for a very short amount of time the tomatoes I did great the sage yeah. 
No problem. The mint, mwah. Everything else died terrible deaths. Uh, and eventually the tomato plants also died. I think the jalapeno plant may be holding on, but it's hard to tell. My point is, is that I'm not good at plants mm. either, but the mint <laughs> seemed to be impossible to kill. So I feel well, that, like it might be an option. That feels possible. Yeah, yeah, that feels possible. I mean, I can't believe I didn't even consider that, but yeah, it is difficult to find because yeah. I went looking for it last weekend, couldn't find it, sent the husband out today. And I was like, I record tonight. I'm going to need it. And he brought it back and was like, it's not the best. You could use half of it. And I was like, I guess. <laughs> no, I was very pleasant about it. I appreciate what he does. Uh, but yeah, I uh, I might look into this grow up. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe there are other people around that are like, I also want mint. And I'll be like, I got what you're looking for. <laughs> yeah. you and then when Chris I open, open my coat and it's just mint. <laughs> you could call it crystal mint instead of crystal meth. I like it. Mm, it's a stretch. I was, uh, I was giving you that, but I like yeah, it. Yeah. Well, Mintawana? Mm, no, mm. I, I'm not, this is the, all these things are going to alert the police, which is what you're not trying not to do. Yes. Uh, we're good people. If you're listening, <laughs> FBI, we're good people. Thank you. Again, we're talking about mint. So we are, you know, it's we not, are. it's not like a, a name for something like it's literally right. Mint. No, it's literally mint. Yeah, yeah. This isn't like a, you know, a little wink yeah. situation. This isn't yeah. a, oh, it's a, it's a literal mint situation. I'm too anxious for doing anything illegal. Oh, I'd, yeah. I'd be sick about it. <laughs> Just... We're not wired for that. We're not. <laughs> no. no, no, no. I could see us accidentally confessing to something we didn't do, to be honest with you. Like, oh, it was we like, will be I'm those so people. I'm sorry. Yeah. I didn't mean to steal. I didn't steal. Why did I say I stole? Like I could see it being yeah. one of those things. That's the only way we're going to prison is by confessing to something we didn't do because police just took it too far and yeah questioned us and well we've all seen making us. a murderer and we know don't don't just go along with it don't just go along with it cautionary yeah. tale now i'm gonna blow everybody's mind because if you're gonna wonder what i'm drinking over here it's shocking it's a diet coke and i'm gonna tell you why <laughs> old ash here um <clears throat> indulged a little over the past couple of months and has decided to have a dry January, which listen, wow. I know, not fun, not fun. I recognize that, but I think sometimes you gotta take the breaks just to prove that you can. <laughs> sure, sure, you know what I mean? And for, to that point, this brings me to a little, a little teaser for this episode, which is- yeah. What are the, what, what's this noise? Oh, it's all my research files I did for this episode. Because guess what? I helped research this week. She I'm did. like a child. <laughs> <laughs> this is like when you let the child mix the batter. You know what I mean? It's like, I made it. You didn't, but you tried. Yeah, um, I've got my cocktail and you've got your cocktail. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're so right. Yeah. You're so right. Also, it should be noted there's a half-eaten bowl of mac and cheese beside me. Oh, so I'm really man. turning into the child swerve here. Um, but yeah, so I I did kind of go on a little bit of a, a rabbit hole and I did do some research for this episode and I was like, I need to be on point. I need to not. Because something that I have learned doing this podcast yeah. in 17 episodes is that I don't read well. <laughs> if I've had anything to drink. And I mean, I'm not talking drunk. Like I'm saying I've had one glass of wine. I find it actually very hard to read aloud. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. this is more also for my own ego, which yes. is, you know, I want to be, I want to be sharp. I want to be with it. I want to give the it. info. I mean, this is my first time researching. You know what I mean? Oh God, I'm so warm. I've been so excited. I, I, I now understand what it's like to be on that side of the microphone and now I'm like oh god she's probably gonna find this in her research and I just want to like I want to get a I want to get a wow I want to get a what or a wow like that's my goal tonight one just one but don't well, fake it don't fake it don't just pretend to do it you know I know it's probably not gonna happen but I don't know how to fake it well because I don't have that kind of training in me um also I know this isn't what you were looking for but I'm already just so damn proud, you know? 
Thank you. But all jokes aside, I really do get it now. Like I, 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 first of all, I just got excited because I was going down a path that I was like, oh my gosh, this mm -hmm. is something. Uh, and then I really was like, I get, I get the, the, the jazziness that you often feel, uh, yeah. about like just being excited to like get this information out there and, and surprise me and whatnot. It's, it's a yeah. bit of a drug. It's a bit of a mint. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. I also am just realizing I wish I'd known about the dry January because I could have dry January. Ah, if I, oh, now I feel bad. Well, I feel bad. Now I feel bad that you feel bad. <laughs> oh, then I feel bad that you feel bad. No, no, no. Listen, I, you know what? Knowing that you're drinking the scoot, let me live through you. You know what I mean? <laughs> let me, let me have this. Sure. Yeah, yeah. Let, let me be the one who's relative. Let this be a hoot nanny all over again, because that was a joy for oh, me. That was God. a joy for me. Again, I only remember about the first half. Which is the joke because I've been drinking that scoot almost ever since. And that was the second half of the show that I don't recall having. But I've seen like I've I've seen video footage that that happened and I've heard it myself. I still just don't recall being there. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's, uh, it's the cross we bear, <clears throat> yeah. but listen, yeah. no, I, I mean, listen, I, I, I should have given you a heads up, but truthfully, it's nice. It's nice to you to please drink for both of us. Well, but this is also, uh, learning about it. Like mid episode, like this is just how we roll. It's how we roll. We keep it loose, man. Yeah. We kind of have a plan, but then we don't. And then we just, this is just who we are. Yeah, it is. Well, that brings me to something very quickly that I'm going to surprise you with. Okay. Yeah. Now I have been wrecked <laughs> with guilt about this. Oh no. Ever, ever since Neon Rider. Okay. The, the Neon Rider reveal. Uh, for those of you who who maybe weren't listening or you don't remember, I can't remember what episode it was, but it was an early one. It right. Do you want? Do you want? Oh, me it to was tell from, you? it was from my old podcast. It was okay. It was. So it, I used it was our it was our first ever okay episode together. That's right. So I used to have a different podcast and Christy came on as a guest, which was technically our first episode of, of, of being on a podcast together. And she revealed to me that she had kept a secret from me, which was that I, <laughs> I had, had in, incorrectly said that Michael Landon was on a show called Neon Rider, which was a show that was in Canada. In reality, it was a different gentleman whose name is eluding me. I should have written this down because I knew I was going to talk about this. Winston? Anyway, Winston something. Yeah. It feels right. Yeah. Anyway, so oh, I feel bad about this already. Okay, this isn't, uh, okay. In our family, we have some family recipes that everybody has, right? The Ash family recipes. Oh what? no. <laughs> and there's one that we always do, which is the bacon wrapped water chestnuts. Oh, oh okay. And we were making them at your house once yes and i was like i don't think that's the right chili sauce and you're like no it isn't and here's the thing it wasn't <laughs> yeah. this is the chili sauce <laughs> you don't have that here i know i know this is the thing i was like in the moment you were like no this is the only one and then i stopped pushing because i was like i don't want to why am i arguing with it there's no point but here's the thing i found some i'm gonna send it to you <laughs> Not this bottle because it's half used, but I'm going to send you one because uh, I saw sure. this in the store. I saw this in the store, started uncontrollably laughing and then literally said out, literally said out loud, Neon Rider. I put it to myself. <laughs> anyway. We, we've just become schizophrenic without realizing <laughs> it. Like we just say the right. And it makes sense to us. Yep. Nobody else. Nope. I mean, there was something... You texted me the other day. I can't remember what it was. And I just said it out loud to myself. And then I was like, why are you just like, it was very, yeah, it's not, <laughs> it's not great. Not well, great. As, as soon as you said family recipes, I was like, oh shit, here we go. Because you asked me for one the other day. Oh, that's right. And I sent you a picture and I was like, I hope this is the right thing. And I was like, oh, she was being nice. It wasn't the right thing. <laughs> And so I, then you said something else and I was like, oh, so I fucked up elsewhere. Right? <laughs> you didn't fuck up. Oh, no. no, I get it. I get it. it yes, was I, I, I dug my heels in too much. 
<laughs> not too much. Like not- you were like, this is wrong. You knew, like you knew the recipe long before I did. So for you to be like, this isn't right. And me to be like, it is, <laughs> was so, so cocky. And I blame <laughs> standing in my own kitchen. For I don't cockiness. <laughs> And I apologize you be, for you it. You should be cocky in your own home. That's your oh. prerogative. No, I'm not saying you did anything wrong. It was in that moment that I went, oh, I don't think they have this here. That was what I thought in that moment. And Which then I was like, I'm ridiculous. I'm not going to push it <laughs> in the moment. And truthfully, I didn't think about it for years. And it yeah. wasn't until this Christmas, I was shopping in the grocery store, saw some, literally said out loud, neon rider. <laughs> Put it in the cart. Oh, neon rider. Oh, neon rider. But I like that that's becoming an adjective or a, a noun. It's a noun, right? Oh, boy. <laughs> <I'm>, <laughs> you drink your kid juice. Um, <laughs> Nouns aren't my favorite literary device. God. <laughs> I tried to Look, bring something back. That's my goal is to try and like make sure I keep stuff. Yep. Keep bringing it back, you know, cast that net, see what happens. You got to cast a net. You got to capture it. Um yeah. I was going to make a kidnapping reference. I don't even know anymore. Um, (laughs) She says, so as you may or may not know, you probably do because you clicked on it. This episode (laughs) is about Brittany Murphy. Why am I belligerent? I have one Diet Coke. (laughs) Um, Is that the joke? Do we find out that the Diet Coke makes me crazy? Makes me crazier than I am on, on, uh, on White Claws? Who knows? Um, but yes, of course, tonight, today, we're going to be discussing the very tragic death of, of Brittany Murphy. Uh, but when we were talking about this ahead of time, we were, of course, trying to think of a, a story from our lives together to share. And the one that came to mind was e- Christy was visiting me. I was living in Toronto at the time, but we had gone back to my hometown of Belleville where my parents live. So we were there visiting them and <laughs> we had gone out and after the bar as one does, we went to Denny's because it was the one place in my hometown that was still open. I remember I ordered pecan pie. Yeah. Did you order pie? Um, I believe I got the pecan pie because I distinctly recall saying the pecan pie tastes like ass. Yeah. That's the only thing I really remember from this event. So, (laughs) (laughs) well, also, but I don't, is, was Crayola head part of this event? No. Okay, then that is, uh, the pie is all I remember. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Crayola Head was from years prior when I was Got still in high school. It. Got and it. We went, we went to Taco Bell and we saw a kid with crayon red hair, which we were started referring to as Crayola Head, and I yeah. fell in love. <laughs> of course. <laughs> in that yeah. moment. Yeah. And we never saw him again. No. And uh, yeah, it was very sad for me. Anyway, um, because <clears throat> it was a small town. And I was like, where is this kid? How have I never seen him before? I hope he's doing well. Anyway, so we were at, now, did we meet Jamie from Wooler? Did we meet him at the bar and he came to Denny's or did we meet him at the Denny's? That's what I can't remember. I, okay. I think we met him at the bar because I distinctly recall being like, we want something. Yeah. And then like, we, I recall walking to Denny's and just like, like a sad Charlie Brown walking behind us, just like, like, cause I think it was partially maybe like a, a guy's hitting on a girl and she's got a friend, but you don't. And so it's weird. Right. Cause, that, cause then she's the third wheel, but you're trying not to be the third wheel, but she's making you the third wheel, <laughs> you know, well- like, yeah, I think you're right. Well, the, the the reason we wanted to tell this story is twofold. One, uh, again, just to appease my own ego, because every story we tell on this podcast is about a man hitting on Christy. Yeah. And this is a story of a man hitting on me, yeah. which I was like, we should tell the listeners that like I had some men interested in <laughs> some point um and then you also brought up of course that this is this does mirror uh today's topic Brittany Murphy obviously she had a very close relationship with her mother and this is what's amazing so we pick I guess we met this Jamie character at the bar we go to Denny's again droopy dog he's following us we sit down at Denny's we order the ass pecan pie and then Apropos of nothing, Christy just starts to lay into this guy. And she's like, you know what? If you do anything to hurt her, 
I'll kill you. <laughs> She's like, my keys will key your car so fast. The joke is, is that he didn't have a vehicle. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Did not have a vehicle. Um, anyway, and which was amazing is that I think that I had maybe spoken three sentences to this person at this point. And yeah. uh, I don't even know that I was interested. I don't think I was. But anyway, we ate the pecan pie. And then it was late. It must have been like, what, three o'clock, four o'clock or something? Something like that. Yeah, yeah. And my stepdad is coming to pick us up because he stays up super late. So that wasn't like weird. Um, and then I feel like this guy, Jamie, just got in the car with us. And yeah. my stepdad's like, sure, I'll give you a ride. And, and, and he was like, I, I think he said to me, like, do you think I could get a ride? And I was like, I'm sure he'll drive you. So he gets in the car and Nick's like, yeah, nope. My stepdad, Nick is like, no problem. Where do you, where do you live? And he was like, Wooler. Wooler is like a 45 minute <laughs> drive away. And bless my stepdad who was like, okay. <laughs> so we drove in the middle of the night. He drove this kid home that we did not know. And uh, he didn't really thank him enough in my opinion. And then we had a 45 minute drive home. I feel like we were rolling home at like 4 30 in the morning or five o'clock we were finally easily going. yeah yeah but jamie had managed to secure my phone number at some point in all of this yes and i remember he called me once and we spoke on the phone briefly and i was like oh this is a terrible idea he was just not not um not up my alley but then i remember getting a voicemail where he was like hey i'm coming to toronto this weekend because i was living in toronto and he's like i'm gonna see my uncle thought i could see you kill two birds with one stone anyway and then he just hung up and I never responded. I never returned his call and I never heard from him again, which I think was for the best. But a couple of things I love about this. One, he was not scared off by your harsh talk to him, even though he and I had barely exchanged words. Yeah. And two, yeah. I just love the audacity of someone uh, asking for a ride and then informing you that you live 45 minutes away. How is he going to get home, by the way? That's another question. How did he get there what yeah. was his game plan? Did he think he was going to hook up with someone and then just like get a ride home the next day? Like I have a lot of questions. Um, I also want to add, uh, I threatened him then. I'll threaten him now. <laughs> like <laughs> it still goes. Yeah. It still goes, Jamie from Wooler. Yeah. If you're listening. <laughs> God, I hope so. Oh, you and me both. You and me both. Oh, Maybe what a just life. Been chasing that dream ever since me yeah maybe he's been chasing it maybe you I never mean, know that's the, that's the hope right he's like cut out pictures from like magazines of you from superstore and then he's like got a ripped out coupon from denny's stuck to the wall all the memories he has of me. this has gone from charming to <laughs> <laughs> i mean yeah yeah. 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 It was a super quiet car ride, right? It was silence <laughs> for most of it. That was part of it that was so weird is that like we drove to his house yeah. in silence for 45 minutes. And then I think the three of us kind of like had a laugh about it on the way home because you Nick was kind of like, oh, so who was that person? Like, is this someone close to you? And I'm like, no, <laughs> not at all. Oh, I don't even yeah. think he paid for my pie, which gentlemen, if you're listening, Pay for the pie. Yeah. Pay for the pie. Yeah. It's a two dollar item. Anyway. Um, but listen, from one protective mother, you to me to another, <laughs> i.e. Brittany Murphy's mother, we're gonna nice. get into it. Uh, for those of you who don't know, but I, I'm sure you probably do, Brittany Murphy obviously was a very famous actress. Uh, and in uh, clueless for one, you know, yeah. lots of big movies. Um, but sadly, in December 2009. She tragically died at ugh, the age of 32, which is so young. Um, five short months later, her husband, Simon, also died. While the press was quick to blame drugs, Brittany's mother, Sharon, believed it was simply natural causes. What really happened in that house, and why did Sharon hesitate to call 911? Ooh-wee, I love that teaser. I love it. <laughs> uh, I will say, I, you, you were the one who suggested this case. 
I did. Like you I were did. one early on when we yeah. were like hesitating about what are we going to do for season two? And you were like, I think this would be a good idea. I would like to do Brittany Murphy. <laughs> like it was like a very quick, like, I think yeah. we should do this because I want to do this. And I was just like, I'll go with it. Yeah, sure. I'm like, yeah, there's, yeah. It is one of the thickest files I have. Yes. There is so much and just layers and layers and layers. And I wanted to say, because I don't know where pieces of information are going to be coming from. I just wanted to say there are two specific places. Obviously the internet was a very big friend of mine, but I watched a documentary called Brittany Murphy, an ID murder mystery. Yes. I'm going to try and share a link early um, in case anybody wants to watch it because <laughs> It gives. <laughs> oh, yes. I've also watched it and it gives. Uh, there's a website that I think you can watch it for free. So might as well go for it. Um, I also read a book called A Case for Murder, Brittany Murphy Files. It was interesting. <laughs> Why am I trying to, to, oh, God, I'm the kid stirring the batter. Why? <laughs> You've done so much research. There's no way you're not going to know everything I'm about to tell you in this. Okay, first of all, <laughs> this level of research is my job. I was just doing Bless. my job. Secondly, Bless. there are so many things that I found out and a couple that I'm not even going to bring in here because they seem pointless and there was just no room. Um... So there's easily stuff that you could say that I don't have in any of this because what you know about researching is you find one thing and there's going to be something about it that gives you a little sparkle and like a little like, ooh, kind of in your stomach. And then you're like, I'm going to keep following that. What it may have been to me may have been something else to you. Well, that's very kind, but I will say that what you call sparkle, I say call racing heart. <laughs> I felt alive researching this thing. I really yeah. did. I did come to life doing it. But anyway, yeah. well, we'll see. We'll see. Everybody yeah. stay tuned. Stay tuned. We'll see if I can live up to Christy's high bar level of research, which, listen, it's big shoes to fill. Um, all right. So let's talk about Brittany's early work because she yeah. was a child actor, correct? Uh, yes, uh, I did find out, and most of this comes straight out of IMDb, so <laughs> you're welcome. Uh, <laughs> Brittany Ann Bertolotti, born November 10th, 1977 in Atlanta, Georgia. Her parents are Sharon Murphy and Angelo Bertolotti, who is a very open Italian-American mobster. <laughs> Very open, yes. Very open. Uh, he, not just like he has simple mob ties, like he did nine years in jail for them. Jeez. So just very open about it. Um, he was working in some kind of like casino or club or something like that. And Sharon came in, he gave her a job as a waitress. She was very, as he put it, attracted to his lifestyle. They married very quickly, had Brittany, then they ended up separating. She moved with Brittany to like New Jersey or something. And then that's where she raised Brittany on her own. Yes. So Brittany has like 68 credits to her career. Uh, her very first work was a 1991 episode of Murphy Brown. God bless it. Right? Yes. Um, she did multiple TV episodes, uh, Blossom, Frasier, Party of Five, Sister, Sister, Kids Incorporated. Thank you very much. I was so jazzed to hear that because I don't I don't normally read Kids Incorporated. I'm like Kids Incorporated. K I D S. <laughs> wow, she's bopping. You were literally your head was like, <laughs> well, that's what you're supposed to do. Sorry, um, of, course, of course. I don't remember some of the people on there. I think Jennifer Love Hewitt was on there, and. Uh, a young Fergie was on there Hello. briefly. There were other people, but I didn't look into it because I just got very excited because I used to love that show. I loved the mini pops, all of that kind of thing. Yeah. Uh, her first movie 
was Clueless in 1995, which what a hell of a first movie. Yeah, wow. Like most people get like a tiny bit in something, but her first one straight out the gate was Clueless, where she had a fairly sizable part. And come on. Rolling with the homies. (laughs) Rolling with the homies. Yeah. I live for that movie. That movie was the first movie I ever bought on VHS. Huh. Which which is like a, it's almost like a DVD, kids, but it's like flat <laughs> and has like a tape that you actually can't touch. <laughs> you must not touch the tape. Yeah. This is imperative. Uh, yeah. That's hilarious. I had no yeah. idea. Did I ever take you to Circus Liquor when you've been here? Have I driven by there with we you? We did. Yeah, yes. we did. Which, of course, is featured in Clueless. Yeah. Like yeah. that movie, that's obviously where it started for Paul Rudd for me. Of course. Um, I also, I just, I think that movie is so great. I love it so much. Me too. I think it holds up. It does. I've you watched know? it recently and yeah, it really does. I think it's yeah. great. I love it so much. So, and so I have adored her since this because who didn't want to be Ty? Oh. You know, yeah. in that movie. So I loved her. Um, but I mean, she went on, like she did other stuff. She did Girl Interrupted, Don't Say a Word, Eight Mile which we have mentioned multiple times before. Mm-hmm. Yes. And and uh, spoiler alert, I'm going to mention it again later in this episode. Uh, she was in Just Married, Uptown Girls, Sin City, Happy Feet. And for 13 years, she was on King of the Hill. I didn't know that. She was Luann. Of course. Yeah. Of so course. like kudos to her. That was like 250 some episodes. Good for her. Yeah, she did the yeah. whole uh, whole thing. So I uh, I thought that was great. Uh, that. She was a singer, uh, as we know with Rolling with the Homies. Thank you. Um, she was the lead singer of a band called Blessed with Soul. Now, oh. I happened to find a YouTube clip of Blessed with Soul. They were doing a mall tour. Okay. It was four kids. Two or three of them are like kind of actors now. And they it, they basically sang and danced a very odd choreographed dance. It was interesting, but hmm. bless her heart. Um, she also, and I had forgotten about this until I read it, um, there's a DJ named Paul Oakenfold, and he had an album in 2006. And being a DJ, he doesn't sing. He brings in singers to sing on his tracks. One of the tracks, he had Brittany Murphy as his singer. Oh, and I forgot because I totally burned that song on a CD at one point because well, kids don't know it, but there was this thing called LimeWire. <laughs> Some people use yeah. Napster, but then Napster got a little dicey to use. So then yeah. you had to go to things like LimeWire and you get uh, some Brittany Murphy and she was good. Yeah, I remember yeah, her. It's a catchy yeah. tune. She's she was, uh, she seems to be mostly described as just like a natural talent, pure, lovely, wonderful soul. Um, so, I mean, I've loved her for years. I find this whole thing devastating, but- Yeah, it is so sad. I've got some fun facts for you. I'd love to hear them. Uh, one, she was set to star in uh, a movie about Janis Joplin. Really? Yeah. Uh, however, the film didn't get off the ground because there were battles over the rights to the music. Mm. I just hate that we didn't get the chance to hear her sing that. I know. Because I feel like she would have really given it, you know? Yeah, totally. Um, she was taught how to give the finger by Eminem, which I find amazing. <laughs> that that was like, that's a- late in life to learn that. You would think so. But yeah. uh, um, also her high school prom date. And this name may not mean something to a lot of you, but it meant a lot to me in the mid nineties. A Mr. Jonathan Brandis. Hello, Sequest. Sequest is right. I think that's how they met because she did an episode of Sequest. That's cute. Uh, He also did Ladybugs and the 1990 version of It for anyone who doesn't know who he is. Yeah, uh, but Sequest was his big thing. I had such a crush on him. His tiger beat pullouts were on my wall. I loved him so much. 
Other shocking thing about him, he dated Tatiana Ali for three years. Really? Yeah. And that, for those who don't know who that is off the top of your head, she is one Miss Ashley Banks from Fresh Prince. That's wild. Yeah. Well, I guess, I mean, Hollywood is smaller than people think. You all start, oh, you all yeah. know each other and start, you know. It, it makes inter- sense. Intermingling. Yeah, exactly. Yes. And of course, just to end this on a depressing note, because yes, we're going to get further depressing as we uh-huh. go. Yeah. Um, for those who don't know, he has since died. He did. Jonathan Brandis. Did. Rest in peace, buddy. Yeah. But that wasn't a mysterious death, right? No, that was a pretty obvious one. Yeah. I was just meaning, should we cover it on the show? I should stop thinking show first and people second, you know? What's it say about me that I was like, I should have started thinking with the show. (laughs) No, you're right. It says that you still Uh, have a, you're still a human is what it says. I've become an android. (laughs) That's fueled by diet cokes. Not at all. Um, No, his death is very closed. Right. So there's no uh, mystery to it. It's just sad. Yeah. All right. Well, as you said, it's only going to get sadder in the next, so (laughs) next hour or so. So buckle in. Um, So, Brittany Murphy, I think one of the things that I always remember about her, it was definitely at the time in my life that I was glued to like celebrity magazines, tabloids. Yes. Covers. I was very young at the time that she was in the kind of like height of her fame and she did date around. And that's not, I'm not saying this yeah. as a criticism. I'm just saying that it was like, one of the things I remember was like, Ooh, who's Brittany Murphy dating now? Cause she has, she's had a lot of boyfriends, right? She has. Um, I found out like in 2000, she dated Tom green, which I don't understand. Cause he also got Drew Barrymore. He's Canadian though. He's so nice. I'm assuming. Um, Don't you think that that's probably part of it that he could turn on that like Canadian, like very probably nice, charming. Not to mention, I mean, there is something where women will flock to a funny man. I think the fact that he's funny and he's Canadian, I think that 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 probably got him a pretty that's pretty long way. That's probably right. I wonder yeah. what he's doing now. Hmm. I hope he's well. Yeah. Uh, 2001, 2002 ish, she dated Eminem. Of course. I mean, they aren't fully saying they did, but it's like, come on. We know what happened. We saw the Um, Yeah. Uh, Then she moved on uh, to Ashton Kutcher because she seemed to have a thing where she dated the the man that was her opposite lead in the movie. And I mean, I know that I've never been through that and I never will go through that. But I get that like you're on a set You're away for months at a time sometimes, and it's just you two and you're playing in love. I get how actors can fall in love with each other. So I get how this kind of keeps happening. Um, I also liked in 2003, she apparently dated Fred Durst. Huh. I feel like I remember something about that actually. Which is crazy, but also like, of course I had a crush on Fred Durst. You did. So... I mean, I was trying so desperately hard to come up with a really quick did it all for the nookie joke, but yeah, Limp Biscuit, no. Nope. Um, So then uh, after that brief moment, she then started dating a talent manager whose name I can't pronounce. uh, And they were engaged until May of 2004. Broke up. Then December, 2005, she started dating joe macaluso Mm. something like that he was a production assistant they dated until and were engaged until august of 2006 now the next one that i know of it varies depending on what source you follow as to when they started dating but this is looking like maybe late december of 06 or early january of 07 she met a man named Simon Monjack. Yes. Now, Simon claims that he met Brittany when she was 17, uh, but he knew she was, quote, too young to touch. So the two remained friends. He would visit her on movie sets, and he was, quote, very patient. Ugh. I disgusting. No, he is 
So gross. So he's claiming that he's been in her life from then. However, there was a close friend of hers and a colleague. They were friends from like 95 to 2005. And she said she's never heard of Simon before that. When so, and she would have known Britney when Britney was 17 and would have met him. And if they had like a flirty thing or something, what 17 year old isn't going to go run and tell all her friends that this older guy was interested in her, right? Yeah. Um, also, neither of the men she was engaged to in 2004 and 2006 had ever heard of him either. Mm-hmm. So I think, and I'm kind of jumping the gun here, but I think that they met and married very, very quickly and knew that it looked bad. So they were like, well, we need a backstory. But obviously she was engaged to someone just like four months before. So we got to come up with something. And it's like, well, people will believe it. I met you years ago and we've been friends off and on ever since. Right. Brit- Brittany's never said it. He says it all the time. Right. So I just find that very interesting. Yeah, that um, is interesting. Another way I found they met, Brittany said that she read a script for a movie called The White Hotel, and she loved the script so much she wanted to meet the screenwriter, being Simon Monjack. Um, There was an article in Variety in like August of 06 that said this movie was going to be filming in October, and that's what got Brittany kind of interested in that. So that supposedly is how they met originally but this is like mid to late 06 as opposed to when she was 17 like he's claiming but that's neither here nor there yeah or it could have been one of those things where like he briefly met her somehow and that she would never remember it and but then in his mind it's like well i met her once when she was 17 and i have to mention that which is like so yeah oh he is he's a real piece of work yeah listen Um, well also I Those can't my wait. Nose shaking. <laughs> I can't wait. Uh, oh gosh. So Simon Monjack was yes. born in 1970 in England. Mm-hmm. He's uh, listed as a writer, director, producer. Oh boy. Although only active from 2000 to 2007. Mm-hmm. We'll get into that. Yep. Uh, he was most known for being writer, director of some god awful b movie called two days nine lives apparently everybody said it was garbage i refused to watch it yes uh and also being the writer and producer of factory girl in 2006 which had sienna miller in it um we will come back to factory girl later on but uh he also dated senator john Kerry's daughter oh in December of 06 or January of 07, which is how his relationship with Britney got pushed back to me. So somehow he dated her before he dated Britney. Mm, interesting. So I'm wondering if he was dating her when he officially met Britney and then those two split up and then he ends up with Britney. Right. But the fun thing about this Simon gentleman, he was arrested in February 2007. Okay. And spent nine days in jail because of an expired visa. He wept uncontrollably oh, and God. told the police he would kill himself if he was deported. So they put him on suicide watch for the entire time that he was there. Oh, God. Brittany bailed him out uh, and tried to hide the fact that he was in jail by telling her friends he had been kidnapped and she paid to get him back. Oh, Brittany. I guess that was Brittany. better. Yeah. yeah. Uh, the couple did not make any public appearances together or even announce any kind of engagement. And then in May, my note quickly uh, moved on. Um, in May, uh, they were at a party at the Kentucky Derby, specifically the Playboy party at the Kentucky Derby, which... I find really weird and amazing all at the same time. They were spotted with wedding rings. It turns out they got married in April. Interesting. So they'd been together probably like January to April and they got married and he was getting potentially deported as of like February. 
So then getting married that quickly, everybody starts questioning what's up with that. Yeah. That's when the story of, oh, I've known her for years. It's been a long relationship. All of that uh, kind of right, thing came out. Right, right. Um, friends of hers said that Simon was begging her to marry him uh, after his arrest so that uh, he wouldn't get deported. And that she was so desperate to get married that it put off all of her previous boyfriends. And previous boyfriend Ashton Kutcher said that she was very needy and full on, uh, so desperate that she would do anything to get married because all she wanted was to be married and live like a princess. So that's a combination that's just waiting to happen. Yeah. You know, that's oh dangerous. Uh, immigration apparently did investigate their marriage um, because they believed she married him to help him get his green card. Uh, but the case and then the I, I don't know if they just have other stuff to deal with or just didn't look hard enough or what but they didn't do anything about it and the case got closed after both of them died interesting yeah very interesting mm -hmm. oh yeah well I've got a few things in my notes about that too but we'll get to it later <laughs> It's taking everything in me not to just shout them out. <laughs> I don't know how you do this. Every week, you you know that you're sitting on something and you you, you just, you're very cool. You're cool. There, I said it, you're cool. <laughs> That's the first time I've ever been called cool. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, I'll take it. You're um, cool, you're cool. I, is, there is, is, I think what it is, is because I know when there's something like really juicy, that's going to get like an, Oh, like you like to do. Yeah. I know that when I've got something like that, I'm just, it's like my Christmas morning. I am just so excited about it, but I know if I, if I just blurt it out, I'm not going to get the solid reaction. I want, I got to build the foundation that's going to let this thing be. Cause if I tell you here, you're going to be like, Oh wow, that's crazy. But if I give you enough facts that you're up here, you're right. Socks off. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I want to knock them. I want to so, knock them. So you gotta, you gotta, you gotta slowly build the layer. You're right. You're right. But you gotta, you gotta do you're it right. evenly so that it doesn't just come caving in. I think I started going landscaping there instead of <laughs> the metaphor I was going for, but. From socks to bushes, from, <laughs> from socks to shrubs. Listen, it's great. I love it. All right, so she got married very quickly to Simon yes. Lonsdale, as we know. What's next? She's got, we, I feel like that's, the other thing we obviously have to talk about about Brittany Murphy yeah. is there was always speculation about her health and drug use, right? Always. Yeah. Especially like around, I want to say like 2001, kind of around there, she got so, so skinny. Like she was always thin. The yeah. idea that she was considered the chubby one in Girl Interrupted is outrageous. Um, but she was, she got like scary, scary thin, but yeah. was always just like, oh, it's a new, new like exercise routine or whatever her excuse was. But it's like, okay, I think, I think we, I think we know. But like her and her husband and her mother always, always pushed for like, she would never touch drugs. Her mother even went so far as to say like she never drank anything at all, wouldn't touch even a glass of champagne, which is hysterical that she said that because then I found an interview where Brittany was like, I only drink champagne. And I'm like, <laughs> mm. so it's yeah, just very okay. funny to me that they're trying so hard to keep her as yeah. a certain image where it's like, just, just let her be yourself. Yeah. And if it's drugs or whatever, it's like, well, just at least you're being honest right yeah um so somebody um a f who did not give their name they're a film producer on something that she worked on said she didn't eat she only drank coffee all day mm. never ate a single thing and also spent hours in the bathroom mm -hmm. Bless. um i have read she's had a severe dependence on prescription drugs dating as far back to as like eight mile which was like 2002. Well, actually in my notes. Oh, uh-huh. 
I did read about a car accident that she had right after <gasps> Clueless. Interesting. <laughs> yes, yes, I got something. Okay, so <laughs> apparently she was in a fairly bad car accident right after Clueless where she had a bad back injury as well as a jaw injury. Have you oh, heard about this? I have not. Okay, so it was, it, yes. So from what I what I found, again, like, listen, I'm not as good a researcher, but bear with me. Um, she did go through that car accident and consequently she did get prescribed prescription painkillers and mm. they say there is sources that that close to her that had said that that was kind of the beginning of the prescriptions and all of the above and mm -hmm. obviously i won't get too far ahead of myself but the pills that were in the home when she died when simon died like it, it was yeah. i in that one documentary i think it was the same one we watched i also watched another um, oh. with, with the pharmacist was talking about how he was like, I joked to Brittany that there's more pills in her house than there is at this pharmacy. And I was like, is that cute? No. Is that a cute joke? No. Nope. Nope. Um, no but uh, the other fun fact that I read was oh. that her mother used to get her prescriptions filled under a pseudonym for Brittany because she didn't want it being Brittany Murphy's name. And the pseudonym she used was Lola Manilo, which I thought was amazing. Yes. I mean... Her name was Lola. Lola. She was a, a show. showgirl. <laughs> How long are we allowed to sing before it's not something we're allowed to do? I think that's it. <laughs> I think we've already pushed it. Yeah, it's not karaoke, Christy. It's, yeah. it's yeah. I wish it was. I wish yeah. it was. But yeah, anyway, there's a little tidbit of something I got for you. So carry well, on. Well, <laughs> first of all, take back that not a good researcher. Come on. You hold your own. I did okay. Uh, I am then going to piggyback off of that. There was a pharmacy owner. He owned, his name was Eddie. He owned Eddie's Pharmacy. He came forward and said he had a list of more than 100 prescriptions he had filled for Brittany Simon and Brittany's mother, Sharon, between January of 2008 and August of 2009. All of them were under various aliases, including uh, Kathleen Moore, Trevor Williams, and Faith Goslin. Uh, he cut them off in August of 2009 because he thought there was going to be an accident there. Wow. Uh, I couldn't find any record of them using that specific pharmacy, but that's not really a surprise because yeah. I could only go based on the prescriptions that were found at the home. Right. Um, however, Simon confirmed it for me. Um, oh, because he told TMZ asked him about this and he told TMZ, well, we use aliases on our prescriptions because quote, you know how this town is. And then when questioned about the pharmacy cutting him off, he said, we're the ones who cut them off. Oh my so God. it's like, well, thank okay. you, Simon. You made my job so much easier. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. He's, he's something else. Yeah, he really so, is. So there's a lot of drug things that went on. Um, but I, we're gonna, we're gonna jump a little to the future. Yeah. June, 2009. Um, she did a movie called Abandoned. Right. Um, I think it was the last thing she actually ever ended up doing. Um, it's about a high powered career woman who brings her new boyfriend, played by Dean Cain, okay. uh, to the hospital for a minor outpatient surgery before he mysteriously vanishes. Oh. The trailer, uh, I hate to be mean, but the trailer is so poorly put together that they give away major plot points that they should not. Like, if you want to reel me in, cut that trailer in half and don't show me the last half, which shows me everything that I was like, oh, I bet. Oh yeah, I was right. Yeah. Um, so her hair and makeup in the movie were terrible. Mm. It, people go on as like, it. she looked awful, sloppy. Her hair was like almost greasy. Her, You could see when they zoomed in at one point, you could see the lip liner very clearly around her lips. Um, but I guess we can't really blame the makeup artist who it was, uh, he requested to do it. It was her husband, Simon. <laughs> Shut up. No. 
Oh my God. I am going to post a screenshot of her from this movie. Please do. Again, I only have black and white. I don't have white ink. Fuck, Christy. <laughs> I only... <laughs> <laughs> I only have the ability to print in black and white currently. So uh, I knew that it wouldn't do it justice if you didn't see it. So of course. I am going to, uh, I will post it somewhere in the case file or something like that. Thank you very much. But um, it is god awful. Um, but the fact that he pushed to do it is amazing mm-hmm. to me. Um, it's one of the very few IMDb credits he has. Oh God. He, he later claims that he did her hair and makeup on four different movies. No, this is the only one that he did it on. Um, but people on the movie say her demeanor changed whenever he was around. Without him, she was one of the team. She was giggling, she was laughing. And as soon as he arrived, she just became his shadow. They used the term Sven Galley quality oh god that's so sad absolutely and keep that term in mind because it's gonna keep coming back <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah 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 so she does this movie in june yes she gets another movie called the caller yes it's set in puerto rico or at least that's where it's filmed yes so Simon and Sharon and Brittany, because they go always together, the three of them, fly to Puerto Rico to do this movie. Simon lurked around and intervened so much that the production had to have meetings about how to deal with him. And Brittany kept defending him. He would show up on set like full drunk and she would still be like, oh, but it's, you know, it's Simon. And so she was fired. I've also read that she was difficult and always late and always in the bathroom. Uh, So she's fired, but you know, they were like, you know what? We're here already. The three of them decided to stay uh, and vacation while they were there. Uh, The cast and crew described her as we just assumed she was on some sort of drugs. (laughs) Oh God. Yeah. Uh, So the day before they fly back, Simon gets drunk and gets into a fight with some locals. Next day, they fly back to LA. They think he's having a seizure or some sort of asthma attack. So paramedics meet the plane. He's rushed to the hospital. Um, everything turns out fine. I don't know what he actually ended up happening, having. He later on goes on to say he had a mild heart attack. Oh my God. So I found it interesting that I also liked Brittany when he's sitting there, he's having this attack. They don't know what's going on. They're like, we need to get him into a hospital. Her reaction was, no, no, I'll just take him home. It'll be fine. There's a lot more coming up later about that. But she had become very paranoid about the press finding out if they go to a hospital, they're just going to assume it was a drug problem or something. Right. And it's like, well, because you're on drugs. That's, <laughs> yeah. that's why we're going to... Yeah, And you can't tell me that's not, like, I get the mentality of like, oh, they're going to think the worst. But sometimes when you're thinking that, it's because you know you're thinking they're going to find out the truth. Yes. Right? So it's like. Yeah, I I wouldn't personally be worried about going to a hospital, like, oh, they're going to think it's drugs because I have no history with being, (laughs) doing drugs. Like, the only people that are paranoid about somebody speculating they've done drugs are people who are known for doing drugs. So I agree with you on that. Now, absolutely. if I may. I am waiting for it. I can't wait. <laughs> All right. So a couple of things to add to this, because this the, the 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 caller timeline kind of fits into one of the pieces of research that I did. Yeah. Um, now, the sources that I was reading about that plane story said that he was having trouble breathing as part of it. And that does fit into okay. what, what I have to talk about here. Um, but I will just dial back for a quick second and say, I did read something where a source said that he, Simon, after the firing uh, of Brittany from the caller, he got lawyers involved and he was trying to make it so that the, the story that came out was that it was a mutual split, that that Brittany and the producers had had a mutual split. So then and, she did get fired. Right. She did get yeah. fired, but then he, he was trying to make it look like. Thanks so much, Simon, for 
letting us know for really making it obvious yeah. buddy yeah i like um, that yes exactly but uh so that also ties into and i know that you're going to get to this later so we don't have to talk about it now but that also that wasn't the first time or the last time that he got lawyers involved to basically bully people into doing what mm -hmm. he wanted them to do uh, yep. So that's what makes me feel like I kind of believe that that's true because there's been so much yes. that's come out otherwise. Um, but yes, so here, very quickly, and I know that I'm kind of going out of order here, but I just oh, felt please. like now is the time. Um, so he gets back. Of course, he's ill. I did read that part of it was that he was having trouble breathing. And it was around that time that he started feeling very sick. So once they got back from Puerto Rico, he was feeling sick. Yes. Brittany died less than a month later. And at the time of her death, they talked about how she had been having flu-like symptoms for weeks. That's that's what I read in a lot of different things. Yes. Like she's been battling the flu of some kind. So as Christy and I are talking about this, I jokingly text her and was like, <laughs> trouble breathing, flu-like symptoms. What was this? The OG COVID? And then I went, oh my God, it was 2009. That was the swine flu. This was the peak of the swine flu. It was the end of 2009. I'll remind you that the swine flu was in its kind of like heyday from summer 2009 to summer 2010. It was mm -hmm. a bit longer on both sides, but the point being, so I did a little research into H1N1. That's right, everybody, the original American pandemic or the most recent one, the swine flu. And here is something that I thought was very interesting. So unlike COVID or the seasonal flu, H1N1, 88% of deaths and 90% of hospitalizations that happened between April and December of 2009 were people under 65. So the big Ooh. difference between swine flu and COVID or the seasonal flu that we all know and love yeah. is that this really did have a huge effect on younger people. For, for a comparison, the seasonal flu, people over 65 account for 90% of deaths and 60% of hospitalizations. So when you start to look at those numbers, it really does feel like the swine flu was something that was hitting young people much harder. <laughs> how, how am I doing? I am just so <laughs> proud listening to you talk in numbers. I, you know, I love it. I love numbers. I you're going to put me out of a job nope, and I could never not could, more, more never thrilled. could, never would. This never is could, just would. making me more and more excited and more and more like I'm going to force you into it. The next time we can be in the same room. Yeah. We're going to get a 24 hour clock. Yep. We're going to, we get 24 hours yep. to research and record an episode. It's going to be so nuts. And I can't wait. Yeah. Like I want us sitting on a couch and I want you sitting there eating cold rice pudding that you've taken out of the fridge and yep. you're going to be sitting there and I'm going to hear the clink of the spoon hitting the bowl as you're like, oh shit, do you see this? And I would be like, no, that explains this. And then we're like, yes. And then I force you into high-fiving at some point. I love it. All of it. I love it. Yeah. Uh, I'm so sorry. Please continue. And I thank you. No, no, no. And listen, we can come back to this after we get to the next point. But but the point that I just wanted to make at this point is that yes. in the chronology that we're following, because we've been following it pretty yes. bang on, he got sick. There was this weird thing with the ambulances meeting them. And then she was complaining of these symptoms. And after we get into her death, which we're going to in a minute, I can I can walk you through the rest of, of what I found in terms of that. But I think it is important to note that also the other difference with swine flu versus COVID, for example, is they weren't rolling out tests. It's not like COVID now where the right. COVID tests, whatever. They're, from what I could read, and I did a lot of reading, there wasn't a lot of specific H1N1 testing going on. It was kind of like if they were just using the test for the, um, for the normal okay. seasonal flu. So, uh, and they stopped publishing test results as of July, 2009. So the, the data that is kind of being used, the other thing that's important to remember is that it's not a hundred percent accurate because they weren't fully disclosing the true amount of numbers that were being tested and people getting sick and stuff like that. So my point to all of this is, is that they were in Puerto Rico where we know swine flu was definitely happening at the kind of peak of that pandemic. Um, and do I think that maybe this ragtag group of three who are known to be multiple different drug users getting fired from movies for all these kinds of things, do I think that they were being super cautious and careful during that time about not 
contracting the swine flu? I'm going to go ahead and say right now, I don't. <laughs> and after we, we talk about her death a little bit more, I'm going to tell you a little bit more about why. Uh, but that's just a little taste about my, my research notes. I could not be happier than what's happening. I feel like I'm watching one of my kids walk across the stage and get their diploma. <laughs> And what this is, is that I just had a couple of weeks off work and was <laughs> just had time. Oh God, it really is a drug though. Uh, don't pardon that pun since we're talking about obviously yeah. a lot of drugs here. Uh, but listen, why don't we take a quick break? Everybody refresh your drink, hit the loo. And then when we come back, we are going to get into, unfortunately, what we were all here to talk about, the actual death of Brittany Murphy. Yeah. See you in a few. All right, you ready to keep going? Yeah. Welcome back, everybody. We're here on True Crime and Cocktails, Famous Fatalities Edition. And of course, we are talking about the very sad and tragic death of Brittany Murphy. Uh, so let's get into it. We've, we've talked a lot about the, the timeline, her background, all those kinds of things that were leading up to her unfortunate death. Um, what do you got for me? Um, well, December 20th, 2009. Around 3 a.m., she went on her balcony to get some air because she was struggling to breathe, just like gasping. She told her mom, quote, Mom, I'm dying. I love you. Jeez. So at some point, she goes to the bathroom, and around 7.30, she says, I just really don't feel well. And she collapses on the floor around 8 a.m., now, there are conflicting stories, shockingly enough, about what went down in that moment. Um, because I have seen things where it's like Sharon, her mother, was with her when she collapsed. And then I've seen reports that are like Sharon found her collapsed. So I don't know. And these various reports are coming from Sharon and Simon because they were never straight on what went down. Um, so when she finds her collapsed, or sees her collapse, Sharon calls 911, Simon starts CPR. Paramedics arrive, the pulse is weak, they transport her to Cedar sinai and she is pronounced dead at 10.04 a.m. Simon then immediately asks that no autopsy be performed. Which is so insane. 100%. Oh, my 32-year-old wife has just yeah. died out of nowhere. Yeah. Let's not look into it. Yeah. Oh, we'll, we'll get to uh, his reasoning behind that. Um, so they do, they do an autopsy. Uh, it comes back as community acquired pneumonia, iron deficiency, anemia, and multiple drug intoxication. They're talking more like over the counter stuff, not a lot of people. It seems, it seems that uh, Sharon, Brittany's mother, when she hears like, drugs immediately she's thinking like cocaine and i love that i literally can't think of anything other than cocaine for like hard drugs what an innocent naive little thing it's she nice is. it's nice crystal um, man there it is See? <laughs> anything uh, she thinks of none of that i think i think she that's all she thinks of when she hears drugs she doesn't think you could be talking about like tylenol and like anything over the counter and stuff like that so she's just constantly like Brittany wouldn't touch a thing. Well, she did. Uh, we have proof of that. Um, <laughs> so her anemia, it says chronic anemia will weaken your state of health and increase a vulnerability for infection. So, and you know what I want to say about that? Yeah. For a girl who is popping so many pills, she couldn't have added just one iron supplement to her handful of, of pills a day. Like, That'll help your anemia. It just, anemia is something, now listen, I'm sure if it gets severe enough, I'm not a doctor. Maybe it's much more hard, difficult to manage. But sure. I mean, I was borderline anemia. Guess what I did when I was a vegetarian? Guess what I did? I started taking an iron supplement. Guess what? I was no longer borderline anemia. You, you know what I mean? It's anemic. So anyway, I'm not trying to belittle it. I am sure that people struggle with it. And I'm, I'm of course being glib and I don't mean to. But my point just being is that it was interesting to me because she was so over-medicated in general. I was like, why wasn't she being treated for the anemia? 
Um, I have read that they just never went to the doctor. Like mm. she was, when she was sick, uh, she didn't see a doctor. She consulted one over the phone and made an appointment, which was supposed to be for the day after she had died. Right. So she wouldn't have got there anyway, but it said that uh, Brittany and Simon rarely went to the doctor because they were afraid paparazzi would see them and it would damage their careers. Uh, to which I say, what career, Simon? But again, we'll get to that. These are all things we'll get to. We will. Um, so there was a lot of issues going on in her autopsy. It said she had, quote, shock kidneys, which is when kidneys fail, like really suddenly. Um, uh, the prescriptions found at the house, because I found the entire autopsy, which was 49 pages, but I wasn't wow. counting. Uh, I also found Simon's. And the best thing about them is they tell you all of the items found in the place where the bodies were found. Right. So I did some fucking math with pills. Yes. Um, so there were 24 empty pill bottles with her name or that of her alias Lola. Uh, plus six current prescription pills. So she had 32 current prescription pill bottles in her home. There was a pill, forgive me, it's like a, I'm, I'm not a doctor, I'm not going to know these, hydrocodone? Yes. Uh, she had been given a prescription for that uh, of 120 pills. There were only 11 pills left. So she consumed 109 of those pills in 11 days. Wow. Yeah. Okay. I'd like to give some context because I have taken hydrocodone after I sure. was in a car accident and I've, you, they will prescribe it to you. Like after you've had surgeries and stuff like that, it is a painkiller. Yes. And I'll tell you this, I won't take it because it made me crazy. I had severe night terrors when I was taking it. My heart would race out of my chest and I'm talking about, I'm taking like the bare minimum. The idea sure. that you you could even be able to take that many of those pills, especially when we know she was like five foot three and 115 pounds. Yeah. That's wild. Again, like I, I I took one of them and, and was like never again, basically. So yeah. that's crazy. I mean, she also, um, it's, I found like it's, it's a painkiller, but sometimes in extreme cases, they use it as a cough suppressant in adults. So I think that's why she was using it. I just find it crazy that the doctor chose to go that extreme, but we'll also get into the doctor in a bit. Of course. But uh, like some of the uh, side effects of that include irregular breathing and anxiety and seizures and low blood pressure and all of these things that she had been experiencing. She was also taking clonopin. Um, which is an anti-anxiety drug. Uh, she had only taken about 42 of those in two weeks. Uh, but those ones are like, a, you're supposed to take like two or three a day. Whereas the other ones, I think you're supposed to take one a day. Right. And so she was well beyond that. Um, those two specific drugs when taken together can lead to respiratory distress, coma or death. Uh, the medical examiner stated that Brittany's death was accidental, but preventable. She'd been sick for at least two weeks. Had they taken her to a doctor or a hospital, it would have been treatable. I've read if she had just gone to a doctor or something 24 hours before, she would be fine. Oh, so yes, there's that. Um, journalists that were at the scene at the time described Simon as visibly on a lot of medication. <laughs> Which oh my gosh. It's such oh. a very specific, crazy way to describe somebody. Yeah. yeah. Well, listen, just to piggyback on that in my research here. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I was reading some similar things to what you're talking about, but the one other thing I wanted to mention, and this is important to remember in general, which is cough medication, like you're saying, hydrocodone right. can be used not to cough. It, it's, it's, you take it to make yourself feel better and feel less sick, but it, it's not great if you have a cold because it stops you from bringing up mucus, which when you have a cold, that is the goal is to expel everything you can get it out right. of you. Right. So taking cold medication, if you have pneumonia will make it worse. This is what this one doctor I was reading about was saying. Um, so the fact that she was taking sedatives, the fact that she was taking cough medicine, she basically also feasibly 
wasn't coughing enough or forcefully enough to actually be bringing up anything. So because she didn't see a doctor for weeks, all of this bacteria and mucus was sitting in her lungs and it wasn't getting out. So it just got worse and worse. And I know that they mentioned that she was septic at her cause of death. Uh, I read that there was a staph infection in her blood found. Uh, yeah. And again, it said, had she gone 24 hours prior, she most likely would have survived. Yeah. Um, but just to circle back again to my H1N1 talk, because mm-hmm. I can't let this go. No, please. Um, I think, here, here's what I think. I also read that there was amphetamines in her system at the time that she died, yeah. but they were the kind that come from like a asthma inhaler. Right. And of course, she did not have asthma, but Simon did. And it seems to me that they were just sharing pills and sharing oh, all that stuff. Easily. Yeah. Um, so that kind of explains that, which again, also, hey, here's an idea, guys. Don't just take someone's inhaler that isn't <laughs> prescribed to you. Yeah. That's so dangerous. Anyway, um, so here's what I think. I think that they picked up H1N1 in Puerto Rico. Sure. I think that he was sick with it. I think that she got sick with it. And because of, you know, the fact that she also had a heart murmur. I don't know if you had read about that. Right, yeah. I read about that from a few places, which is considered, of course, a high risk category. And I was reading that if you were in a high risk category uh, and you got much like we're learning now with COVID or we know learning, we, we've known for the last nine months. Sure. Um, they did say that if you were in a high risk category and you started to feel like you were getting the flu, you had to go to the doctor and get antivirals because there, there was a great chance, obviously, that you were going to have a much more severe reaction to swine flu. And because we know it it was wreaking havoc on younger people, not the traditional over 65 bracket. Um, It was again, a completely treatable and curable, but Mm -hmm. I think that that had something to do with all of this. I think that uh, I'm going on record now. I know we're we're not even in our, our theories portion of the episode yet, but I think that that's part of it. I think that they got sick with that. They didn't get the proper medical help. They were trying to medicate themselves at home. Yeah. And uh, it, again, led to a very preventable death. Now, I know we're going to get into Simon later, but when he died six months later, they said that he had the same bacteria in his lungs, which I found also yeah. very interesting. So, well, I'm going to say this. I did skip over this because I didn't want, I'm, I was hoping it wouldn't in any way fuck up your reveal. <laughs> But you've already said the word, so I feel like I can safely say it. Uh, she did have a staph infection. You know where she got it? Puerto Rico. You know how she got it in Puerto Rico? Because Simon and Sharon brought it back with them. They came home sick with a staph infection from Puerto Rico and uh, gave it to her because it's the three of them. Like Her last few days were the three of them laying in bed together watching movies. Because they were like, ah, she's got a bit of the flu. They thought it was laryngitis. It was her dying. That's what's so tragic about this. This is, this is also, and I'm going to go into it. I didn't think I would, but I'm going to. As a mother. <laughs> yes. I get that Brittany was a goddamn adult. But if I'm like to the point where I'm like best friends with my child and I'm like, I'm living with them and I'm in and around I, well, actually, no, scrap that. I don't give a shit. If my child is 80 years old, if they're like, if I watch them deteriorate before my eyes, even if it's against their will, they're getting to a fucking doctor or a hospital or something. I'm not just going to lay there and wait till suddenly they're unconscious and be like, oh, okay, we should call 911. Yeah. Like, the 911 call, she was hysterical on it. So I, I don't think she was malicious in any way. I think she probably was on pills herself yeah, and was just not, you know, cause all of the math that I do with pills, I don't even account for ones that are Sharon's because they only counted the ones that had either Simon or Brittany's name on them. Cause Simon's pill count is something else, but I we'll, we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Um, I'm going to try and buzz through some of this quickly. So at any yeah. point, you you stop me and yeah. do what you need to do. Um, Brittany had a will. Uh, she left everything to Sharon. But Simon claims that when they got married, he asked her to add the note to his will, her will that said, I am married to Simon Monjack, who I have intentionally left out of this will. That's Which is weird. very random. But then again, it comes back to, I think he 
married her so he could stay in the country. And I think that was his way of being like, see, I don't want your money. Put it in your will. No, no, put it in your will. I don't want your money. And there. Right. So I think that's kind of what was going on, but you never know. Uh, So they had a funeral, very small, only like 30 close friends. Um, Sharon insisted on going to the service in an armored car with armed security guards. Like she and Brittany were both very, very paranoid. And I think Simon made them that way. But again, we will get to that. Uh, So Brittany dies in end of December. January rolls around and Simon and Sharon go on Larry King. I tried desperately to find that episode and Mm -hmm. I couldn't. But I found the transcript. Oh my God. It's not as fun. (laughs) <laughs> but i'm gonna post it on the uh virtual case file on true crime and cocktails that's amazing com. so it's also very lengthy i warn you but i'm gonna give you some fun uh crap out of it now yes um so people that were there say that they felt sharon's outburst seemed really rehearsed oh. um once again Brittany had this prescription for hydrocodone um she got it 11 days before her death and she had taken like almost a hundred some pills. So she took a lot. Um, Simon claims in this interview that that was actually Sharon's prescription. Um, He repeated different lies. He changed his story. Sharon told 911 on the phone when, when Brittany collapsed that mouth to mouth had been performed. She tells Larry King it never was. So Oh, this gets weird. So we've got, I'm going to get myself more comfortable here. So uh, apparently Simon and Brittany were planning on having a baby. They wanted to just start, they wanted to move to New York and have a baby right away, starting in the new year. Right. Uh, Sharon even says, we were already talking baby names, which is, is a lot, Sharon. Uh, so then Larry King is like, so she had laryngitis and that was it. Right. And they explain the whole mom, I'm dying. Uh, and he's like, well, she knew she was dying. And Sharon goes, oh, this was like an hour before. And Mon Jack goes, no, no, baby. This is, you've just forgotten time. So he referred to her as baby, which is so fucking creepy. Yeah. Then Sharon responds and goes, oh, sweetheart. Again, this is mother and son-in-law so we'll talk about that oh my god so i also love on my notes that i have things highlighted and sharpied with either question marks or lie (laughs) (laughs) uh simon says i did cpr from the minute my wife collapsed until the minute the paramedics walked into the room that is a lie she she was found collapsed from what i've read um he did not she screamed for him he came upstairs they didn't start chest compressions until she was well into a phone call with 911. So, okay. Um, then it comes into he didn't want an autopsy. This was his reason. These are quotes, and I am going to need a hot shower <laughs> when I am done. <laughs> Quote, This pristine body that was curvy in all the right places, the skin like silk, How could I say in front of her mother, cut her up? What insanity is that? Also, in the middle of that, um, when he said this pristine body that was curvy in all the right places, Sharon then goes, which now makes less sense, more sense to me after your comment. Yes, she was in a car accident. What did that have to do with anything? That's weird. Yeah, but now that you comment that she was in a car accident, it's like, was she meaning that? Was Sharon so, like, coked out or something or pilled out of her mind, pilled out, uh, (laughs) that she just, in her mind, was thinking, like, it was 1995 and Clueless had just happened? Like, what was happening? Or was she suggesting that she had some sort of scarring on her body from the car accident? Like he's saying her pristine body that's curvy and and she's like, she was in a car accident. Like, is that referring to a scar of some kind? Yeah, I don't know. Just 
creepy. Yeah. Uh, so they're like, so Larry King's like, so uh, there were multiple prescriptions found at the home. And Simon's like, well, I suffer from seizures and migraines. So they weren't in her name. They were. Yeah. Um, and he's like, oh, they were for you. He's like, they were. Uh, well, then your name would have been on the bottle. That's bad reporting. And Simon goes, oh, it is bad reporting. And just the more I read of this, the more it just feels, and I don't even want to say the name, but I'm going to because that's the parallel I'm making here. He feels very Trump. Mm. Someone says something to him and he's just like, yeah, you're right. It's bad. Fake news. Like all that garbage. Right. I fucking hate those two words together. And I hate that I've said them. Yeah. Um, the police wanted to come in and inspect the house after Brittany was found. Um, and Simon was like, we let them into the house. We don't have any secrets. And Sharon came up to me and said, but they don't have a search warrant. And Sharon's like, yeah. And he goes, but really, what do we have to hide? And Sharon goes, the living room. We were just so stressed. And it's like, what's in the living room, Sharon? What does that even mean? I don't know. Again, I think she was on pills. Yeah. So this is when I said we would get back to it. So Larry King asks, how many stories uh, are, I've heard a lot of stories of you uh, being a Svengali, like a controlling factor. Monj Monjack, sorry, it's all in everybody's last names. That's why I keep slipping. Uh, he's like a Svengali. He's like, yes. Oh, I should be so lucky. What is that even? That is yeah. such a bizarre response to that. Now, just to clarify for people, Svengali is a character in a novel from like the 1800s. Um, it's a person who's like manipulates and controls another person to do what they want. Why would you say I should be so lucky to control someone? That's just so gross. Um, and then he's like, Larry asks if Brittany was the breadwinner, to which Simon says, oh, no, of course not. And so he's like, oh, did you earn a living? And Simon's reaction was, uh, Sharon, please. So Sharon responds with, he wouldn't let her pay, I would say, a dime for anything. So it's like, oh, that's fucking rehearsed. Where it's yeah. like, I will say your name and you will do what I want you to. Oh, boy. Um, then they're asked, like, where are you going to go from here? You live together right now, but what's going to go on? Are you going to go to England? Where are you going to go? He says, I would never leave my mother-in-law. Are you crazy? So, so creepy all around. Again, yeah. the, the transcript alone, I mean, it's, it's worth that few minute read. I'll tell you that. It's disturbing yeah. all around. Wow. Oh, well, listen, you said yeah. something in there that made a little bell ring in oh, my head. This, and that was, yes. this is my second piece of research. So you mentioned that they were very paranoid. You mentioned that, yes. that Sharon wanted the armored car. She was very paranoid. Well, yes. enter a new player in the Brittany Murphy story. And that mm. player is a woman named Julia Davis. Okay. <laughs> oh, see, I'm trying to build it up. I, um, you're layering. I'm trying to layer. It's like a dip. So, like it's a it. dip. Um, right now we're at the lettuce, but soon we're going to get to those refried beans and yum, yum, <laughs> give me some. Okay, so. <laughs> I like that a lot. <laughs> so, Julia Davis was a Department of Homeland Security officer. She was working at the San Ysidro border crossing. And this was in 2004. And this is one of the largest border crossings in the United States. It was July 4th okay. of that year. She said that there had recently been a memo that was put out saying that there should be, there was intel that there was going to be heavy tourist, uh, sorry, not tourist, terrorist activity and people potentially trying to get into the country. So she claims that when she worked that day, she all of a sudden saw several people just getting waved through, and she thought that that seemed odd. So she went to tell her bosses, but because it was July 4th, they apparently weren't working. So she goes above their heads and reports that she thinks that there's been uh, suspected Al-Qaeda coming oh, through the border. Boy. Yes. Hey. So she has, th that again, that report went to her boss's bosses, essentially. Yep. Her bosses did nothing. Oh, so instead of her letting it go, she reported them to the FBI. The Department of Homeland Security in turn, allegedly, this is of course allegedly, yeah. but the way that she tells the story is that they retaliated against her. They harassed her. They used wiretaps. They read her emails. She claims her and her husband were falsely imprisoned twice. 
Um, now, she followed a lawsuit against the Department of Homeland Security, which was apparently it apparently this did happen from everything that I can find. Um, and apparently she did win that lawsuit. Now, again, I'm speculating because all I could seem to find was stuff that was kind of from her point of view, but I couldn't find yeah. anything saying it wasn't true. So bear with me. We'll again, we'll take all of this uh, sure. through, a, through a critical eye. Um, but Judge Daniel Leach ruled that the government caused her to have to resign involuntarily because she was getting uh, harassed so badly. He also ruled that the government engaged in illegal conduct against her. And shortly after she won this litigation, she claims that the Department of Homeland Security escalated their reprisals by raiding her home with a Black Hawk, he Black Hawk helicopter that literally landed basically in front of her house, oh. a Black Hawk helicopter. Oh, boy. And a special response team with a total of 28 federal agents armed with assault weapons. In spite of not possessing a search warrant, apparently they spent an hour and 45 minutes searching their home. Her neighbor was a young man named Matthew Judd who videotaped the, the raid, and he was 25 at the time. Mysteriously, he died several weeks later. She was not at home during the time of the raid, but apparently her parents were. So, huh. here's, so I know you're thinking, What's, what does all this have to do with anything, Lauren? I'm going to tell you. So how does all of this connect to Brittany Murphy? She claims, Julia Davis claims, that she was very close friends with Brittany Murphy and that, she, that Brittany Murphy had publicly supported Julia Davis when she was going through these issues. And she believes that Brittany and Simon were targeted by the government because of their connection to her. She claims that they tried mm -hmm. to deport Simon, which is why he and Brittany got married so quickly in a secret ceremony. And she claims that they were on a DHS watch list. Now, it seems to me that if he, as you've already stated, had a visa that had expired, perhaps yeah. he was trying to be getting deported, not because there was some sort of weird conspiracy, but just yeah. because he was in the country illegally, which feels <laughs> sure. like it makes sense. Yeah. Um, the claims of their friendship are so interesting because there's nothing that can really substantiate it. One source said that there was no proof of it other than a letter that Julia had written to Brittany asking her to speak on her behalf. And apparently Brittany's publicist responded saying, she doesn't know you. Thanks. Bye-bye. But Brittany's father, uh, when he was alive, he believed Julia Davis's story. And he said that Brittany had told him she was afraid to go home because of the sneak and peek and other terror tactics being used against her because she had supported Julia. What's a sneak and peek? I'm going to tell you. <laughs> a sneak what? and peek is a search warrant that authorizes law enforcement officers to essentially go into your home without permission or your knowledge and to secretly kind of clandestinely, clandestinely, that was the word they used, which I thought was amazing, uh, search the premises, usually requiring a very stealthy break and enter. Oh. Yeah. So all of this, I was like, I don't know. This sounds really far-fetched. This sounds like this woman has, you know, has she made this up? She has also, uh, you know, released a, a full-length documentary about this. Did I try and watch it? You better believe I did, but I could not find it anywhere. Um, but then I started to, again, because listen, this is, I learned from the best. I learned from you. I'm like, I got to look. I can't assume that she's lying. I can't assume that this is all fake. So then I started to do a little bit of cross-referencing. Now, I know we're going to get to, I think, Simon's radar interview, but in that interview, he apparently said they had 56 cameras around the house as well as a scrambling device so that no one could listen to their phone conversations. At some point, and again, I couldn't find this myself, but it, he did say that, that both he and Brittany believed that they were under government surveillance. Um, again, I couldn't double, I couldn't, uh, you know, find multiple sources of when or where he said that, but that was somewhere in the reading I was doing. But here's the other thing. Brittany was named as a witness in the case that the government had brought against Julia Davis and was set to appear in court in February 2010 to testify. But she did die, of course, two months prior in December 2009. Right. She was apparently only set to be a minor witness. But that does kind of seem to prove that they must have at least known each other on some level. Again, I couldn't seem to find any sort huh. of proof like I couldn't find any like transcripts of like the witness lists. Um, sure. So I don't know whether that's true or false, but uh, again, this is the story that Julia is certainly telling and her and Brittany's dad. Uh, but apparently they both, she and Brittany's dad believed that the coroner didn't do a proper examination of Brittany's body and they feel that her death was swept under the carpet. 
Uh, of course, her dad did die in 2019. So there's not really right. anybody that's kind of continuing to pursue this other than Julia. But Julia has been a little busy. That's right. I visited oh. something called her IMDb page oh. on which she has many producer credits and director credits that are uh, as recent as 2019, as well as a stunt credit for The Amazing Spider-Man 2 in 2014. And she has, uh, has, has she's listed herself as Helen Hunt's stunt double from As Good As It Gets, uh, although that was not credited in the film. And uh, she goes on to have editor credits, music department credits, cinematography, second AD, writer, actress, the list goes on and on. And that makes me feel like this is a woman who really wanted to be involved in the film and television industry in some way. She's listed a million different ways from Sunday of all these different projects that she's been a part of. And I'm not saying she wasn't a part of them. But what I'm saying is it's interesting to me that her first credit, I believe, was around 1995, which, of course, is is nine years before we know that she was working for Homeland Security. Um, So I didn't continue to find anything further about her life. But what's curious to me is she was interested in being film and TV. She then took kind of a left-hand turn seemingly into working for the government. Then some time around that same time, claims that she's become close friends with Brittany Murphy. How did they meet? Was she in Hollywood? She's seeming to be, you know, she's been a stunt woman for many years. She's been in a bunch of things. She's producing and writing her own stuff. She has this documentary about this whole story. It just feels to me like, sadly, again, someone who's really, really wants to be involved in the film industry. And to that, I say, unfortunately, Julia, I think that that does kind of discredit you in the long term because it feels like for a story that feels a little bit fishy to begin with, I don't know. Is it possible that Brittany was a witness for like, to, to show like, so you can have someone on the stand say, this person sent me a letter asking me to speak on her behalf and I don't know who she is kind of thing. Great point, because in some of the reading that I found, Julia was saying, well, she was going to testify in my defense. But then in other reading that I did, it simply stated that she was listed as going to be one of the witnesses that was called. And to your point, it's very plausible that the prosecution, of course, who would be prosecuting sure. Julia Davis, could be calling Brittany Murphy as a witness to say, I don't know this woman. That's also possible. Yeah, and I couldn't get clear kind of, uh, from the reading I was doing anyway, I couldn't find any sort of clear path about what that that is. But I had that same thought that you did, which is, okay, she was set to appear, but that doesn't necessarily mean that it was in Julia's defense. Yeah. Um, I still think you did a great job. Thank you. <laughs> I, I don't know how I feel about Julia. Mm, it's, I know. It, it's, it's sketchy at best, but I mean, there is a lot of stuff in this that's sketchy. So yeah. I, I don't really know. I know. Uh, I know. Uh, there's going to be some stuff. We're just going to have to like skip over some things because we only have so much time and there is, I just again I can't believe how much crap there is in this case. I know it's it's wild. Um they had a memorial service. Yeah. Uh in February. It was scheduled February 3rd at the Saban Theater. Mm-hmm. I don't know what that is, but I assumed mm-hmm. you might. Yeah. Um so it ends up it was less of a memorial and more of a launch event for the Brittany Murphy Foundation. It promised a star-studded event with alleged performers f- performances from Britney's friends and colleagues, such as Eminem. The venue was booked one week before the event. It was very rushed. Uh, people were charged a thousand per an individual and ten thousand for a corporation. Which why would a corporation go to Britney Murphy's memorial? But that's fine. Okay. Uh, The venue thought it was a memorial, so they had no idea that people were being charged. And the day before the event, it was canceled due to a family illness. (gasps) So the Brittany Murphy Foundation is for the hope to keep her memory alive and to offer financial support for education, cancer research, and global problems like Haiti. 
Haiti was very big in the news at that point. So it felt like they were grasping at straws. Um, Days after the Larry King interview aired, it came out that the foundation wasn't registered as a nonprofit, so they stopped taking donations. They then started calling it a private foundation. Simon claimed he put a million dollars into it to get it off the ground. He did not have that million to put in. Oh, boy. So. Wow. Okay. Yeah. Uh, the Oscars came around in March. Yep. Uh, he, Brittany was in the uh, memorial tribute, so Simon was given an invitation. He went and took a friend of Brittany's as his date. Um, it didn't seem like it was like as like a date date, but like he just wouldn't go alone. And I guess Brittany's mom didn't go. Um, and when the press commented to him that they felt it was like a little inappropriate to bring a date to this, he responded, which, oh, Simon, I wouldn't have someone ugly with me. <laughs> this is also like a 300 and some pound man who's like, just, okay, I don't even give a shit about his weight. He's just a gross human being to begin oh, he's with. slovenly. So. He was like, I remember the photos from that time period and like his shirts that were too short and like, you know, like he, mm -hmm. yes, no, he was, yeah. he was very off-putting, certainly. Yeah. Yes. Uh, he tried unsuccessfully uh, to get into many after parties, but was denied. Uh, he told Radar that, oh, they told me they were at capacity. I just think it's such a shame since Vanity Fair said that Britney was their favorite interview and one of their favorite people. It's like, well, then maybe they would have let Britney in, <laughs> but not you. Yeah. Like gross. Gross. Uh, and then again, he was asked, like, why are you going to the why are you trying to go to all these Oscar parties? Like, settle down. I was only going to the parties for Sharon so she could see friends and be part of the grieving process for her. I could not find Sharon there anywhere. It was him and this date and that was it. So how was going there going to be for Sharon? And then he says, and it's my 40th tomorrow. So I thought it might be nice to celebrate after all the pain. And it's like, well, okay, sure, sure. Your wife died like three months ago. <laughs> yeah, calm down, man, right? Jeez. Yeah. So then he does an interview with Radar, which you mentioned. Uh, he was allegedly paid $10,000 to do that no. interview. Radar has a thing on their website that is like, we will pay you money for good information. So he really liked to go to the press and really anyone that could offer up cash. Um, he showed the cameras around the house. He showed the bathroom where Brittany collapsed. He looked into the camera and said, you're the first people to see the infamous bathroom. Oh my which God. Which is gross. The whole time he's smoking a cigar. He uses the cigar to like point at things. It's just gross. Uh, he said, today was the three month anniversary of her death. And before I saw you, I was with Sharon at the grave. Well, yeah, at that point in March, her grave still didn't have a headstone. It wouldn't have a headstone until the middle of May, which feels like a very long time. Maybe that's yeah. a process. I don't know. No, that sounds like a long time to me. Maybe I'm wrong, but yeah. uh, certainly for people who live in Hollywood with money and all those yeah, things, you would you think would think that that would yeah. just, yeah. Okay. Uh, so for the sake of time, I'm going to try and just like buzz through some of this. Do so it. May 23rd, yeah. Simon has not been feeling well for a few days tingling, numbness. He's reliant on a, an oxygen machine. He has fevers between 96 and 105 degrees. The fact that that alone wasn't enough to go to a fucking hospital. Okay. Yeah. He was coughing up thick black mucus. He was fainting. Um, his publicist said he saw his client two days before and he looked fine. Simon said that he had a heart condition and was having bypass surgery soon. Um, he had been diagnosed with pneumonia nine times over the past year. So overnight, May 22nd, Simon's struggling to sleep because he's sweating and he's coughing. 7.30 p.m., Sharon hears him making some sort of gurgling noise, went to him. He's laying in bed. She sat at his bedside. He had liquid like pouring out of his mouth. So she would just like wipe it away from his mouth. And her Sharon's quote is, it wasn't like he was losing consciousness, but simply closing his eyes and becoming unresponsive, <laughs> which 
if I may, you may is the fucking definition yep. of losing consciousness. Yep. yep. So Sharon, oh Sharon. Um so last time she hears him make any sort of sound is 7:30. And then she sits beside him for hours. And then at like 11 something, she's like, something isn't right. He's really not responding to me. So she calls 911. They try and help her. They're like, can you get him to a floor? She's like, I can't. He's gigantic. (laughs) I, I say because she was very manic and I get that she was in a very intense energy. So I get that. But, uh, and they were like, he's gigantic. And she's like, I can't. And it's like, yeah, he, she wouldn't have been able to move him. Yeah. So um, they show up, they try CPR and all of this. And I think at that point they were like, oh, it's, he's been gone for a while. So Jesus. Yeah. Well, I also very quickly just want to, yeah. uh, we, we didn't mention this and I'm so sorry if you were going to mention it later, but it should also be noted that around this time they were sharing a bed, Correct. Oh, Sharon. yeah, we're getting to that. Okay, sorry, my bad. That, okay. No, 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 it needs to be said. Yeah, right? that's the that's yeah. the detail for me where I'm like, this is crazy. Yes. Yes. Uh, so Simon dies. Yes. There's an autopsy, community acquired acute bronchopneumonia. The medical examiner calls Simon's doctor, a Dr. Krupp. Yep. Um, it's ironic because, you know, the Krupp is the- Absolutely. Um, asks him about this bypass surgery that Simon had claimed before he was going to have. And the doctor said he had not diagnosed Simon with any cardiac condition. And he performed a recent EKG and CT scan and no problems were found. I also find it complete bullshit that he went to a doctor and had scans done, but okay. So a drawer is open. uh, And inside the drawer, it's just prescription bottles everywhere. Um, Many of them are emptied. Some are still sealed. Uh, The most of the prescriptions have the names um, either Simon Monjack, his alias Trevor Williams, Sharon Murphy, or Sharon Monjack on them. Oh my God. He checks the other side of the bed and is told by Sharon that that is her side of the bed. All of the prescription bottles and items on the nightstand belong to Sharon. Uh, There are also some prescription bottles of Britney's in the drawer. The dresser near the bed has Sharon's clothes in it. They said they just comforted each other after Britney died. Now, in that documentary that that we had both watched, my favorite quote, um, they asked Simon's mother, Linda, if she thinks that potentially there was a sexual relationship between Simon and Sharon. And she said, quote, Simon wouldn't have been with Sharon. He only liked women who were young and beautiful. (laughs) Oh, okay. The shade, Linda, the shade. Amazing. But also, like, that's like saying that any any mother is going to say that about her son. Well, he only liked young women. Well, you were right, across yeah. the ocean. And by the way, we know they were sharing a bed. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Sharon denies that Brittany and Simon had any sort of abuse when it came to prescription pills, which we've proven otherwise. Yeah. There were 50 prescription bottles logged. One was from like 2008, four from 2009, 45 of them were from 2010 alone. And that's from January 15th to May 19th. That's not a lot of time. No. His main ones, uh, Cymbalta, which is like depression and anxiety. Um, He had the prescription for 97 days. He consumed 186. Jesus. Uh, He was supposed to be taking one a day. Uh, He also was on lorazepam for anxiety. He had the prescription for 104 days. He consumed 517 of them. Oh my God. Between January 15th and May 23rd, that is a total of 129 days. He consumed 1,949 pills. Most of them were prescribed at about one a day. Some of them were three or four a day, but even four pills a day would get you to 516. And he did over 1900. And I'm, again, this is the assumption because these are prescriptions he had and they were 
this is how many pills were missing from each bottle because Brittany's page, her autopsy, one page of the pill bottles they found, his five pages of them. It just never stopped. Wow. That's so wild. The doctor, this Dr. Croup, in 2015, I found a disciplinary hearing, which I was very excited about because it had. Ah, uh, fuck. I can't remember what her title was. I'm going to get eaten alive for that. Um, it had Kamala Harris. It had her name on it as what was she for California? Uh, I want to say she was a senator. She was some, I can't remember that. I'm pretty yeah, sure she we're, was. We're going to remember that. Yeah. Um, but I don't know who brought this on, but it was for multiple patients. One of them, the patient is labeled as SM. It says SM was seen by this doctor from August 2007 until his death on May 23rd, 2010. He was prescribed amount, large amounts of hydrocodone and lorazepam, even though SM was never seen in the office. SM had several medical issues, but the doctor did not address them. There was no notation for any re there was no reasoning behind why he was prescribing these things. There was no follow-up visit with SM. Uh, he, this doctor failed to document any sort of physical exam. He failed to have a reasonable treatment plan. And so, I mean, this entire thing is going to be on uh, the virtual case file, but come on, that's got to be Simon, right? Of course. It has on. to be, right? Yes. Um. So, the autopsy, the medical examiner called Linda, Simon's mother, to inform her that her son had died. And he said, or she said, at the time of his death, Simon was not legally married. As it, it, the book that I read really was like, oh, so him and Brittany never got married? And I'm like, no, when, as soon as you die, your spouse is no longer legally married to you. So right, yes. Once there is a death certificate, you're not legally married. So it's not a surprise. Um, and he had a minor child living in England. What? <laughs> yeah. Wow. So this comes to Christie's section entitled, The Real <laughs> Simon Monjack. Have I been just leaving a little bit of breadcrumb to make us be like, he's weird, but whatever. We'll get ready, folks. <laughs> So in 2002, a woman named Marcia Newman had a daughter with Simon named Jasmine. He stayed with her until Jasmine was two and then left and never spoke to her again. Whoa. Uh, in 2008, there was a rumor going around that he had children and he told people.com that he and Brittany planned to start a family. Although, quote, according to the Internet, I already have several. <laughs> he actually did. <laughs> Oh no. Yeah. Uh so which is just such a dick move to be like, oh, look at all these people telling lies about me. And it's like, that's true. It's all true, Simon. Yeah. So after he died, uh, Simon's family got his laptop and found emails from two women who were looking for child support from him. So wow. he supposedly has a son and a daughter. Um, they also found wire transfers of large sums of money to various lawyers for settlements, some as large as $48,000 in a single transfer. <laughs> what was that for? Well, let me tell you. <laughs> in 2001, he met a woman named Simone Bien. He told her that he was a billionaire, but all of his money was tied up in Swiss accounts. They married after three months. And then the second they got married, would you believe he turned slovenly and just tried to like use her money mm -hmm. and suddenly proved he had no money of his own. They separated five months later. Their divorce wasn't official until, two, until 2006, where she took him to court and was awarded, would you believe, $48,000, which he didn't pay until he used Britney's money to do it. Oh, wow. In oh. 2001. He was engaged to a woman named Tara Rafik. He told her that the diamond ring he gave her was just this pure diamond. It turned out to be a cubic zirconia. She tried to contact Brittany when she heard that the two of them were together, but couldn't reach her. Brittany paid for her own ring. Technically rings because she couldn't decide between two, so she bought two. Mm. Yeah. Mm. 
Um, so there's the script for the White Hotel, which is what got Brittany interested in wanting to meet him in the first place. He claimed he wrote that. Well, it was actually written by a woman named Susan Potter. Simon offered to look over the script for her and help her make any changes, but instead he simply removed her name from the script entirely. So when Brittany wanted to meet the screenwriter, Simon claimed it was him. Oh, wow. Somebody involved in this knew about it. It was either an agent or a manager, I'm not sure. Uh, they tried to intervene Veen, uh, and let her know about Simon, and would you believe they were fired? His nickname in the UK is Conjack. <laughs> Oh, no. Every oh, wow. single achievement he has had, he inflates, which brings us to Factory Girl. Mm -hmm. It's the work he's most known for. It's the work he used to make a name for himself in Hollywood. He sued people that were making the movie, claiming that it was his story and that they had stolen it. If they ever wanted this movie to be made, they had to just suck it up and settle with him and give him a writing credit. The actual writer of the movie, George Hinkenlooper? Hickenlooper? Yes. I, oh, boy. Um, he posted on IMDb the true story of everything that happened, but Brittany called him and begged him to take it down. He warned her about Simon. She hung up on him. When he called her months later to check up on her, Simon refused to let him speak with her on the phone. So... Oh boy we're not done oh boy um, a woman who was simon's girlfriend at the time invested two hundred thousand pounds in a film project of his that turned out to be fake in 2005 warrants were issued for his arrest in virginia for credit card fraud he's been evicted from four different houses by the bank and they sued him for four hundred and seventy thousand dollars which he has not paid he at one point claimed he single-handedly founded the Brit art movement and had purchased 150 paintings. The truth is he purchased one and sold it immediately after he bought it. He claimed to be a billionaire, an heir to a British steel and fortune, and owned a, the largest private art collection in the world. These are just some fun quick quotes that people have said about Simon. He was spellbindingly believable. He lied with authority, poise, specificity, and directness. Bullshitter. That might be my favorite. <laughs> Mani manipulative liar and sociopath. He begged, borrowed, and stole. Didn't care who he hurt. He was a lavish liar. He pulled the wool over everyone's eyes. He was chaotic. He liked to make the most out of anything he'd done. He was interested in photography, so he told people, I've taken pictures for Vogue. Simon's quote was, I know I've been called a con man. I'm not perfect. I never said that I was, but there's been so much rubbish written about me and Brittany. Most of what you read is made up. My problem is I don't look like Ashton Kutcher, nor do they like the fact that she married someone who's not famous. Here, stars like to marry other stars. <laughs> or maybe they were just concerned about Brittany, you know? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I have one extra thing. This is my final please, little no, gift. Please. And this one comes from a personal source. So shut the fuck up. <laughs> <laughs> We're at the refried beans. <laughs> yeah. 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 So I won't name names, no, but but like, but later. Of course. Okay. <laughs> Of course. So someone I know mm -hmm. was working at a very expensive Beverly Hills boutique sure. at the height of Brittany and Simon's marriage. Ooh. And they came in, got a bunch of stuff, and they went to pay, and the credit card was not in either of their names. And the person, of course, was like, I'm sorry, sir. Do you have ID to go with this? Like, this isn't, like, we know they, your they name. did their job right they know his name because they were all over the tabloids at this point mm -hmm. and he apparently very convincingly was like are you kidding me this is britney murphy she is super famous obviously we can't have credit cards in our real names because otherwise there'd be fraud and blah 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 now truthfully i had gotten this story a while ago so i i haven't been able to confirm whether or not they allowed him to make the purchase i'm pretty sure they did not um but at the time, they were, of course, 
trying to be kind by not going to the press and whatnot with that story. But to all of this, I offer that as well. I like insider information. <laughs> yeah. Um, but, you know, again, like, I think it, it's, it, 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 you, you mentioned credit card fraud in there. And I think that this is, again, this is, this is some, some more firsthand accounting that, yes, this man was very comfortable committing all kinds of fraud, uh, lies, yeah. all of the above. You know what's happening right now before our very eyes? What? When you do research, you've turned us into castle. So we've got the super hot, charismatic, no, doesn't really research, but is going to dip a toe in, (laughs) has some like in with like high up people who might know some stuff. And I'm the hard nosed bitch that (laughs) that just wants to get this solved, but can't help but fall in love with you. Yeah. Well, listen, I mean, that is a beautiful, beautiful comparison. I am here for it yeah oh gosh all right let's just blow through we're running out of time this is a long running out of time we're done but we've just said there's so much information to get through okay the joke is we could have done two in this and i had no idea i didn't either we should have known but Uh, i'm gonna i'm gonna hit something quick and then we will just move on to something amazing and ridiculous and then we'll be done yes uh so there's a guy named jeffrey morgan roth he was britney britney's business manager for the three years prior to her death. He found that Simon drained the cash reserves by 80% between her death and his. Huge amounts from her pension plan and bank account were gone. Hundreds of thousands of dollars. Uh, Prior to their deaths, they were struggling and living beyond their means. Uh, Once this guy needed Brittany to sign a tax form, it was urgent, so he just took it right to her house. Simon refused to let him see Brittany. Instead, he took the form, went and had Brittany sign it, and brought the form back. People are saying he had tight control over her. Some are saying he controlled what roles she did, um, who she could speak to. He kept her at home. He kept her from friends. He plied her with drugs. All this kind of stuff is what people are saying. Um... There was talk on, could it possibly have been black mold that killed them? I I don't think so. I mean, they claim they did a test in the house two months before Brittany died and that it was clean. Uh, Sharon tried to sue the builders of the home, claiming it was black mold. She ended up having to drop the suit. She sold the house in like 2011-ish. Um, she also in 2013... Uh, sold some of Britney's stuff online, like on a, some sort of Beverly Hills online auction, mm-hmm. like <laughs> outfits from oh. movies, um, different other clothing she had, and also like her passport and like SAG card and expired checks and stuff, like just stuff that it's like, that feels weird to me. Yeah. Um, her dad, Brittany's dad also didn't like it and tried to get a cease and desist, but he couldn't do much about it. Um, so this was my favorite piece to research. In January of 2016, a show called Hollywood Medium with Tyler Henry started. I'm familiar. Tyler Henry, for those who don't know, is a 19 year old kid, or he was at the time, because this yep. is, I'm talking pilot episode. He comes from a, a small town. He doesn't know much about pop culture. He claims to have psychic psychic abilities. This show has gone on for like five years or something now, or five seasons or something. Um, His very first episode, his very first guest was Jamie Presley. He claims he doesn't know who the person is before he gets there because it throws off his reading or then he could cheat or whatever, but it's like, okay. So first he's telling Jamie, like he felt her paternal grandparents and in the end, he f- felt like a father figure of hers. Brittany, or Brittany, ooh, sorry, Jamie. Jamie Presley bought it hook, line, sinker. In the middle of it, out of nowhere, he goes, a younger woman who feels like she's passed way too soon. And when she comes through, she's making my lungs hurt quite a bit. Jamie doesn't do anything. So he goes, okay, she's blaming an outside influence. She's saying that she's in a very manipulative situation where I feel that an outside person who is detrimental to influencing her actions in certain areas still gets nothing. 
there's a reference to a B initial. Still nothing. <laughs> I just saw Britney Spears. So that usually references the name Britney. And he sits there for a second. And then finally, Jamie Presley screams, Britney Murphy, to which Tyler split second just goes, who's that? Oh, shit. She's like, oh, she was an actress that passed away not long ago. She was very sick. The man she married, he OD'd, uh, which he didn't, Jamie, but okay. Uh, when he st- when she started seeing him, he manipulated her and was more of a Svengali than anything. That term Svengali coming Svengali, back. Svengali, man. Then in the end, uh, he was like, oh, well, she didn't have a message for you. She's not here for you. She just was coming out, whatever. Apparently at some point after Britney's death, Jamie was stopped at a at the airport by like TMZ or something like that. T- wanted to get her reaction to Britney's death. And they were like, were you friends with her? To which she said, I was before she married him. Whoa. Yes, but I could not find a single photo of them together. Doesn't mean they're not friends, but still this, this kid threw me, like, it's just, he really just kept pushing her and pushing her and pushing her. And then was like, I, I'm saying fucking Britney. And like, it's like, we get it. You're, you're probably not telling the truth, Tyler. Yeah. Um, so that was supposed to be Britney's ghost. But then a month later, Taryn Manning, who is known for Orange is the New Black, and uh, she was in 8 Mile with Britney, and they were super tight still. Uh, Taryn was DJing an H&M party in Toronto. Okay. She gave a shout out to Britney and played the song Lose Yourself, which is the main song from 8 Mile. And just as she brought up Britney's name, the music shut off and the DJ software shut down. And Taryn had only the belief that Britney was stopping in to say hi. Okay. (laughs) But also in 2016, if you're still playing Lose Yourself, (laughs) you might not be the most up-to-date DJ. (laughs) Um, Don't get me wrong. If that song comes on the radio... I'm going to sing the hell out of it, but that's not of course. the point. Of course. Um, there's a lot of things I would love to get into, but of course we don't have time. But like, since all of this has gone down, Sharon, Brittany's mother, has really remained out of the public eye. Um, after Simon's funeral, Simon's mother has just been unable to contact Sharon. Sharon wouldn't let her have anything that belonged to him. Um, I read that when Simon's family took his laptop, they started going through it. And we're like, oh, maybe the police should have this. And when Sharon found out the police had it, she then tried to say that they stole it and submit a police report that they had stolen it, which is outrageous. <laughs> so I get that there are so many things, but I have a theory and it's so specific. I wrote it down so I wouldn't forget. Love it. I'm very proud of this. Okay. So this is going to be a theory on their entire relationship. (laughs) Because I can't be stopped. Why would you? Right. So Simon sees Brittany as an easy target. She's clingy. Uh, He used her to get a green card and to boost his resume in Hollywood. Afraid that she would see right through him and leave him, he mentally abused her and made her paranoid about everything. Uh, He told her they were being followed, that her career would die if paparazzi spotted her at a doctor's office. He made her think she was under surveillance. Um, The house was like Fort Knox, surveillance cameras everywhere. Uh, Brittany's friends said that Simon is the one who incited all the paranoia regarding the paparazzi with her. He just wanted to um, manipulate her and separate her from the outside world. So he wouldn't let her go anywhere without him. He probably pushed pills on her, which is how she lost weight and got so sickly. So I think, and I can't believe I'm saying this, but I think toxic shock syndrome had something to do with her death. Whoa. Symptoms are flu-like. Uh, there can be seizures. Um, it's caused when the bacteria for a staph infection gets into your bloodstream It is considered a medical emergency. Um, Complications include liver, kidney, and heart failure. Uh, Signs of kidney failure, shortness of breath. In her autopsy, she had shock kidneys, meaning her kidneys failed very quickly. Right. Um, It can progress rapidly. Complications can be shock or renal failure or death. 
Um, a staph infection can be spread by direct contact with someone who's infected and can also develop from pneumonia. So that as well. Um, I, she was also, and I'm sorry for anyone that makes this uncomfortable, but it's natural, so move on. Um, she was also on her period at the time. So if she wasn't chain if she was using tampons and wasn't changing them out enough that could also lead to toxic toxic shock um i believe her death was an accident which i can't believe i'm saying yeah. i think he tried to capitalize on it because he went to numerous interviews and just hounded the press to try and get his face out there um but then his money started to dry up um i think he told her not to put his name in the will so he could get away with marrying her for her money without her actually realizing that's what he was doing because he then spent all of her money even though it was not his to begin with without sharon realizing it yeah then he started to get sick and sharon realized that simon was draining the money that wasn't his and figured out that he'd destroyed her daughter so i think she let his illness drag out. Maybe she gave him the wrong medication a couple of times. Maybe she denied him that oxygen tank he was so obsessed with and needed. Anything to prolong his suffering. Then one night, she's sitting by his bed. She watches him breathe his last breath. She waits until she's sure he's dead, then calls 911. That is my belief. I believe she knew, she figured it out at some point in the last little while that he was pretty much responsible for the destruction of her daughter. Yeah. And I believe she sat there, watched him suffer. And that's why she, she waited five hours from the last time she heard him say any sound or utter a sound before she called 911. So I truly believe she sat there and watched him die. And that was like all she needed for like a, well, that's as much closer as I'm going to get. And so that's what I'm going to say. And to that, I say, Sharon, if you're uh, looking to get Brittany's story out there, I would love to talk to you about that. I have no writing credits to my uh, <laughs> resume, but I'd like for that to be my first one. So theories at truecrimeandcocktails.com. <laughs> Okay, first of all, that was amazing. So well written. Kudos. Second of all, this is so plausible. I mm -hmm. completely think you're right. Third of all, I know that we, again, I talked a, a great deal about this weird government conspiracy angle. And I know yeah. that part of what Julia Davis and Britney's father believed was that potentially they were poisoned by the government. I think that that's starting to feel, again, a little implausible, but I thought I would just mention it before we go. Sure. But uh, in terms of theories, I think exactly what you said but also they had swine flu <laughs> <laughs> yeah like i think overall yeah. we we're pretty much on that same boat of like we think they had something bigger going on yeah and they were already so incredibly unhealthy with the amount oh. of like prescription drugs that they were wolfing down mm -hmm. like multiple different pharmacies multiple different names so that they could go to different doctors and get you know whatever it just I think that I think both were accidents. Yes. And because I think their, their bodies were in such poor health that they couldn't fight anything off. But I truly believe that she figured it out in the end and just let it happen. Cause she said she slept in that room. She sat by his bedside table. She wiped his mouth anytime there was something that came out, but it's like, the last time she heard a sound was 7.30. And then when the paramedics got there, they're like, oh, no, he is, he's dead. And I think she waited. I think you're right. I, I think, think that there's some, that, she that, that seems, yeah. And since then, in the wind. She's come out a couple of times. Um, she sold the clothes because I think he left her with so little money. Yeah. And then what's, what's she going to do? Suddenly out of nowhere, go get a job for the first time in 40 years? Like- what she she hadn't worked since Brittany uh, not forty years Jesus Christ do that math Christy, um she hadn't worked probably since like Brittany was like in clueless, right? Because then she just moved in with Brittany and went around with her and did whatever with her. So, I guess like she got the money from selling that house, which that house was bought, torn down, rebuilt, and 
sold for so much more because now it's apparently way bigger than it was. But right, I'm just saying she had that money to go on. And then she sold some items, I think, out of a desperation, like I need a little more so that she can just go and live her life quietly and whatever. But yeah. Well, listen, no matter what, of course, it's a tragedy. Obviously, when somebody dies so young, it, it always is. Um, you know, Simon also died. Um <laughs> Yeah, I, I'm not trying to be crass, but you know what? Uh, it, it is very sad because it does feel like at the end of the day, no matter how you slice it, multiple sources said that if Brittany had been in the hospital, even just 24 hours sooner, that she probably would still be alive today. And that is yeah. to me the real tragedy of this, that it wasn't, I don't think it was some large government conspiracy. I don't think it was a murder. I don't think it was anything nefarious. I think it ultimately was just a very codependent relationship, both the one between him, her and Simon and the one between her and her mother and the three of them, I think also were yeah. a weird codependent kind of toxic relationship. And this paranoia and and fear, probably drug induced as well as as all of the above, um, that that kept them just from getting the medical attention, the simple medical attention that could have saved them, both of them. And I think that that really is the tragedy here. Christy yeah. Oxborough, your research always top notch. Uh, as for me, I'm glad I stirred the batter. I'm happy that I got a couple things in there. I saw your face change a couple times, and that's all I wanted. Um, <laughs> It was truly a pleasure, truly a pleasure. And listen, maybe I'll dip my toe again in the future. Who knows? But for now, it was fun. Um, but listen, thank you, everybody, for listening. This, of course, is our first episode of Season 2, Famous Fatalities Edition of True Crime and Cocktails. If you have a theory about Brittany Murphy or anything else we've ever talked about on the show, email us, theories at truecrimeandcocktails.com, and make sure you're following us on all of our social accounts if you aren't already. I mean, goodness, what are you doing? You're listening this far. You've, you've listened to this for almost two and a half hours. <laughs> Clearly, you've got to be following us at True Crime and Cocktails on Instagram and Facebook and at Not Detectives on Twitter. Uh, the next episode of True Crime and Cocktails in our Famous Fatalities Edition is a multi Multiple fan request, which is Murder on Middle Beach. This next episode, we're going to dive into episodes one and two of the four-part series on HBO, Murder on Middle Beach. If you haven't watched it yet, you got to do it because it is wild. And I cannot wait to find out what Christy finds out about that. Christy, do you want to say goodnight to the people? Um, I do. But before I say that, I want to say I'm going to do this in my best, Lauren, but I'm not I'm not great at it. Uh, Lauren Ash. I just want to thank you for your research coming out the gate hot. I, uh, okay. I, I didn't get to the right level. I was, <laughs> no, to, but... it was pretty accurate. It was pretty <laughs> accurate. I, I love that you researched the excitement. Childlike is what like you were, <laughs> you were the, again, we keep bringing it back. You were like a child on Christmas morning. You were just, it was like, I woke up at 6 a.m. And you're standing at the end of the bed, just like, is it time yet? Can we check if Santa's here? Like, that's the excitement level. I can feel across through a computer screen. I could feel it. It was that heated. And I am here for it. Uh, you're going to put me out of a job. And I could not be happier that I, I can't wait to see where more Lauren research goes. Uh, well, uh, listen, I might be out of a job soon, so I might <laughs> more time on my ass. What am I talking about? I will be out of a job soon. I'll Look at another one. Anyway. I've been pushing on Twitter. <laughs> I, some, I somehow became like the voice of like the people trying to get it to come back. Like people keep tweeting at me and they're like, how do we, how do, what else can we do besides this? And I'm like, I'm not the leader. I don't know. <laughs> but apparently I am. And I'm, I'm just, uh, I'm just trying to get uh, a wrong undone. Well, listen, That's bless you, bless you. Uh, but listen, onwards and upwards, always discovering new things like my love of researching this podcast and I couldn't be doing it with uh, anyone other than my favorite person. So thank you so much. Well, as the Beckett to your castle, it's an honor. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Good night. <laughs>